Mr. President, the State Board of Education regular meeting of September 14, 2021 is called to order. Marilyn, are there individuals who wish to address the board during today's meeting? There are. I have people who are here in person who wish to address the board, and I have people who are joining us remotely who wish to address the board. Um, and I will review the rules for public comment. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes to address the board, and I will keep track of time. We will be strictly following the time limits so that everyone has an opportunity to speak. We've got a large number of people who want to provide comment. It is the practice of the board not to respond to comments during the public participation portion of the meeting. We will maintain an atmosphere of respect for all people and disrespecting anyone by name or otherwise will be asked to cease. And that's all I've got. I will tell you who can come to the end of the table, end of the table to speak, and I will also tell you the next person that's up, the person on deck, so that you can um, plan for that. If you have hard copies of things to distribute, if they, you would just give them to probably Leah Porter, the Michigan Teacher of the Year, would be kind enough to take them, and we'll distribute them around the table for you. If you don't have meeting materials, that's just fine. Just provide your comments. You can monitor it right here. So our first speaker is Connie Robinson, and she will be followed by Marcy Jakovic. And we are ready whenever you are. Is the computer in front of the microphone? Um, can we lower? Nope. Can we can we lower the computer, we'll lower so, that, the computer so that so that we make sure, sure that sure she's well, well heard? Well that. Just make a quick, I'm sorry, Marilyn. No, no, it's fine. I appreciate all help. There, that's a little less distracting okay. to you. Okay. Um, good afternoon. Um, my name is Connie Robinson, and I would like to speak today on critical race theory. Um, I understand that the board does not recognize this as a problem, so I'd like to read from an article published on June 23rd. Um, quote, thousands of teachers have pledged to continue teaching critical race theory even if state law bans it, contradicting those who claim nothing like that has ever been taught in schools. The Zinn Education Project has collected signatures from more than 4,200 teachers who pledged to teach the truth despite new state bills against it. Part of the pledge says, a recent bill introduced in the Missouri legislature exemplifies a rash of, sim of, a, of similar bills that aim to prohibit teachers from teaching the truth about this country, that it was founded on disposition of Native American slavery, structural racism, and oppression. And structural racism is a defining characteristic of our society today. We, the undersigned educators, refuse to lie to young people about US history and current events, regardless of the law. There is currently, uh, unquote, there is currently legislation being crafted here in Lansing that would prohibit the teaching of critical race theory. However, six teachers in 66 Michigan cities have pledged to, to teach critical race theory, regardless of the law. Here's, here's the funny thing. I, I've been to many, many school board meetings all over my district. And every time critical race theory is brought up, everyone says the same thing. Critical race theory is not in the curriculum. And I find that kind of amusing because we all know that children can be taught many non-curricular subjects behind the privacy of the classroom door. We also know that um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, implicit bias training, culturally, culturally responsive teaching are all under the umbrella of, in some form of critical race uh, theory. And they are, all, all of those items I just uh, listed are rampant in the schools. Um, therefore, I strongly urge the board to at least begin to start the conversation about critical race theory and ideally pass a resolution clearly stating that critical race theory has no place in the classroom. Now, here's a list of some of the cities where teachers have um, vowed to teach critical race theory, regardless of anything. Alpena, Ann Arbor, Battle Creek, Belmont, Benton Harbor, Blissville, Brighton, Byron Center, Caledonia, Cascade, Chelsea, Clarkston, Clawson, Clio, Commerce Township, Crystal Falls, Dearborn Heights, Dalton, Detroit, Dexter, East Lansing, Escanaba, Flint, Galesburg, Georgetown, Grand Haven, Grand Ledge, Grand Rapids, 
Hamtramck, Harper Woods, Hazel Park, Holly, Holt, Howell, Huntington Woods, Jackson, Kalamazoo, Lake Orion, Lansing, Linden, Livonia, Lowell, Macomb, Madison Heights, Mason, Orchard Lake Village, Ostico, Oxford, Pinckney, Plymouth, Portage, Portland, Rockford, St. Ignace, St. John's, Scott, Southgate, Traverse City, Warren, Waterford, Wayne, West Bloomfield, Whitsum, Wyoming, Ypsilanti. I thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Marcy Jerkovic, followed by Ilona, Ru Ilona Rugg. And if I mispronounce your name, please correct me. My name is Marcy Jankovic. I'm here from Jackson, Michigan, representing the Jackson Patriots. Uh, we meet at least monthly. And I'm here to speak on behalf of myself as well as the entire group. Allegedly, critical race theory is not taught in Michigan schools. That's correct. It's not taught in Michigan schools. It's implemented. That's the difference. It has come to light that the NEA nationalized CRT, committing the full range of left-wing radicalization and claiming there's no CRT in K through 12 as a sleight of hand using the word taught per a press release from the Department of Education. The technicality is used to try to sneak CRT past the people. CRT is composed of both theory and praxis. The activism done with that theory in mind. While proponents say CRT is not taught in class, what they mean is that teachers are not reading academic CRT legal texts to children. No one claims texts are being read in class. Our claim is that adherents will engage in CRT praxis by infusing the concepts of CRT, even if simplified form, into the school. The strategy is specifically advocated by the critical race theorists. Some educators overtly demand CRT in their curriculum guidelines, evidenced in the adoption of the resolution by the NEA to promote CRT in all classrooms. They don't teach the theory, they implement it. Thousands of teachers signed the pledge, as the previous speaker um, alluded to, which is the brainchild of the Zinn Education Project. Zinn demands that students be taught their truth about this country, that it was founded on dispossession of Native Americans, slavery, structural racism and oppression, and structural racism defines our society today. Zinn is a collaborative effort of teaching for change and rethinking schools, nonprofits that have each been paid tens of thousands of dollars over the years to the NEA, by the NEA. NEA allocated thousands to fight back against anti-CRT anti rhetoric and to oppose attempts to ban CRT and or the 1619 Project and conduct opposition research on groups that oppose the use of CRT. One NEA proposal joins with Zinn to stage a National Day of Action to teach their lessons about structural racism and oppression. Dr. Rice alleges that CRT is only taught in law schools. CRT is born of critical theory established by the Frankfurt School, including theoretician Marcusa. The academic discipline was fostered by Derek Bell at Harvard when he began to study law through the lens of race. Bell maintains that society is divided along racial lines into white oppressors and black children, similar to the way Marxism frames oppressor-victim dichotomies along class lines to promote communism. CRT contends America is permanently racist and that its legal structures are invalid. While the tenants were created in law schools, those ideas have filtered down through the work of people not directly involved in the formation of CRT, but exposed to its worldview and adopted into their professions. Co-founder of CRT, Richard Delgado, said that in some ways, more lively in education than in law. The CRT talking points for school districts recently received from MASA claim citizens do not understand CRT. Yes, we do. The talking points seek to sow doubt on those thank, who are. Thank you, ma'am. I'm sorry to cut you off, but there's a lot of people who are who need to. Come I see. In. I thought if we spoke for a group, we had more time. You're speaking on behalf of a group. The Jackson Patriots. Yes, I put that on the forum. That would be a group of people that are here collectively. Oh, they're on. They're watching on Zoom. <laughs> Three minutes. I'm sorry. That's right. the time limit Thank for you. an individual person. Excuse me. May I? Um, either have your statement or if you could email it to me, I would appreciate Yes, that. I'll email it to you. I've written all over it, so I want to so send much. you a I clean copy. That. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Do you, if you don't know his email address, you can feel free to send it to me. Okay. Schneider M at Michigan.gov. All right. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Is that your pen? Ilona Rugg, followed by Holly Spalding. <laughs> Um, Ilona Rugg, Highland Township, Michigan. I'm a very recent uh, retired public school teacher in Oakland County. Um, 
do you guys know what racist is? A person who shows or feels discrimination or prejudice against people of other races who believes that a particular race is superior to another. Never in my 30 years as a teacher have I witnessed any of my students discriminate or believe that they were superior toward another student. The public school system is indoctrinating and shaming our children. Public schools are following an exceedingly inhumane program that minimizes education, avert racial discrimination and segregation. It scares children by teaching that their accomplishments are vicious relics of white supremacy. They are killing the planet by using natural resources, by driving cars, eating meat. You dumb down the curriculum with Common Core in which parents can no longer help their children. And critical race theory pits minority children against whites, sexualizes little kids to break them from Judeo-Christian notions of modesty, chastity, and temperance. It drives a wedge between parent and child and humanity. You lie about our country's history, the very country that has given you so much freedom. We are the most humble, giving, diverse, free, and cleanest country in the world. Otherwise, why are millions of people coming into this country? A racist country does not elect a black president, have a female Jamaican Middle Eastern Indian vice president, diverse baseball teams, black football, basketball players, reporters, singers, actors. The same goes for all the LGBTQ. It is not the place to instill these sexual preferences in public schools. School boards will lie about the curriculum and they will, or they will call it by a different name to subvert the question. We are all forced to pay through our tax dollars for this garbage. The government tells us when, where, and how they are going to educate our children. CRT, LGBT, DEI, BLM, whatever else you want to call it actually is creating hate and bullying in children and adults. What was never there to begin with is being created gay against straight, minority against majority, black against white, liberal against conservative. This hate is being created in our schools. No wonder so many children are suffering from depression. And as a teacher, I can tell you, I was told it is up to my discretion what I teach behind closed doors, that no one has to know, even if the um, principal is conservative. And as far as transparency goes, I was told not to give parents too much information so they don't ask too many questions. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Holly, Holly Spaulding, followed by Julia Barker. This will be quick because I don't have anything prepared. If you'd like to introduce your your co-presenters, that'd be great. So this is my son, Jacob Spaulding, and this is my um, youngest son, Miles Spaulding. They are now homeschooled. I have, for the first time, he is going into 10th grade and he is going into 6th grade. So this is the first year that I have homeschooled them. We just started yesterday. and. They're not too happy about it. They want to be with their friends. They want to be in school. They love their teachers. But I cannot take the risk of them wearing their masks. They don't want to wear their masks. They hate the masks. Anything but the masks. And now if you guys have the vaccinations, my husband and I, my husband is vaccinated. I am not. My kids are not. We have decided as a vaccinated and unvaccinated parents not to vaccinate our kids because we don't know what is in it. We don't know any long-term studies. We don't, there's too much information we don't know. And I want to know everything before I put anything into their bodies. Just like I go to the store, I buy organic stuff. I, everything I prepare for them, I know what's going into their bodies. And you guys want to make something mandatory that no one has any idea what's in it. You're not telling us. We've seen the sheets on the, that, that come in the vaccines. They're completely blank. And they're left blank for a reason. Why? Why can't I know what you want to put in my kid? I, they're both completely vaccinated other than that. 
I am not an anti-vaxxer. They are both up to date. They're both in scouts. They're both in sports. So they have to be up to date on their vaccines. I will not get them this COVID-19 vaccine ever, ever. So I want you guys to know that. And I am one of many. Right now, there are parents that are going, going, along, getting, going along to get along, but there's, there's, there's got to be a line. And once we draw that line, we can't go, oh, well, when you cross that, oh, well, now here's the line. Oh, well, you cross that, oh, now here's the line. No, we're standing up at this line. We want no masks, no VIX. It should be a choice. If you, and, and there are people that need to wear masks and need to have the vaccine. But these guys do not. And I do not want them vaccinated. I do not want you to put that into our schools, please. It should be our parents' choice. And I appreciate your time. Thank you. This concludes public participation with the people that we have here in person. We will now be moving to virtual public. Sorry. There's one more. You called my name Julie Barker. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Julie. <laughs> My apologies. One more person. That's my error here to give public comment in person. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Julia Barker. I live in Hall Township. I am the president of my HOA. Community means a lot to me. I am a recovering liberal. I have spent a lot of my time trying to ask questions and, and figure out how I could be a better person um, in the community that it makes up the left. And I'd like to share with you a couple stories. First of all, during the presidential election, I was in conversations with someone who was um, supporting Elizabeth Warren. And these discussions about race taking place, I was told that it doesn't matter that I voted for Obama twice. It doesn't matter that I had dated black men, that I had family that were black. I was racist, inherently racist. I won't, I won't accept it. I love like Jesus does. Now, I want you guys to think of a time when you came home crying from school, when you needed your mom's consolation. I started a discussion with my coworker, and she let me know that after picking up her son from school, now mind you, CRT is not officially implemented in our classes. This is last year. Her second grader gets into the car and is bawling his eyes out. What's wrong? What, what happened there today? Mommy, I didn't know that I'm racist, OK? Through conversations at school, Lord knows if it was a teacher or another classmate, he had been told that because of the color of his skin, he hated someone else. This is a lie. I'm not here to say that racist people don't exist. Unfortunately, this is the devil's playground, and I know that there are some evil people in this world. But with that said, there's a majority that is not going to accept the fact that they are someone who hates other people based on their skin, based off of the color of their skin. I really encourage you guys to think about this. Now, I also wanted to bring up COVID and the issues that we're dealing with trying to become free to go and get an education. Now, I have not vaccinated my children. My children are very healthy. My doctor, by the way, went to U of M. He went to Notre Dame. He's been practicing um, longer than I've been alive. After 11 years of practice, he found his patients were sicker than they were when he started. Well, what's going on? He started to look into holistic wellness. He's now an MD, ND. He is because he wants to be able to accept insurance for those of us that can't afford a fancy doctor that has alternative ways of dealing with disease, treating the disease rather than the, or the illness rather than those um, effects of the illness. Now, we have people that are fearful and they're fear mongering. We have a two dose vaccine, it doesn't even eliminate point. One sixth of ICU admissions for children. There's no reason why children should be taking a vaccine. I encourage you guys to consider your COVID mandates for the school. Thank you for your comments.
moving to virtual participation. And people will be admitted into the lobby <clears throat> one at a time to make their comments. I will be keeping a three minute timer. So if you are listening to this on YouTube, when you join to provide your comments, please mute your YouTube, state your name, where you're from, city, and also um, then provide your three minutes of comments. So Mike, will you let the first caller in? These are all people that have pre-registered according to the board bylaws. <clears throat> is, is there a caller in the lot in in here in the where are you? Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. If you would please give us your oh. name, where you're from, and provide your three minutes of comments. Perfect. Uh, hello to the board. My name is Anna Penela. I'm from Brighton. Um, just a comment listening to your meeting from earlier regarding the board norms. Um, I think one of the reasons why you guys are having such a hard time defining norms is because a lot of these things that you're trying to define are truly actually um, choices of parents, and they should be made by parents only, not not by a board. So that was just a side comment regarding earlier. Um I would like to see the State Board of Education um, stand up for our kids a little more strongly. I feel like um, either you guys are in agreement or you are getting bullied by the health department. Uh, I don't know if you're aware. I'm fortunately from a Livingston County school that was in school all last year, um, and we dealt with quarantines. I think quarantine is a giant problem that I think the State Department of Education should consider eliminating. Um, there were 305 positive COVID cases in our district last year from September through June, um, which is probably very equivalent to a strep throat or a flu or something like that. But on account of those 305 positive cases, 20 to 30 kids per positive case got quarantined. So that led to 9,000 quarantines. So as the Board of Education of the state, I would imagine that should bother you that these children are missing out on their education. Mind you, 99% or more of those kids were never sick. They're healthy kids. I don't know why anyone would endorse um, having children miss their education and be sent home for 10 to 14 days when they are healthy. You need to allow these choices to be made by parents. Um, and then I also want to echo the sentiments of everyone regarding critical race theory. I think that it is infiltrating our school. I've seen it already in curriculum in a number of things. For some reason, in a number of my students' classes, or my, not my students, but my children's classes, I have four of them, um, they're required to announce their pronoun. Um, some of them are young enough that they don't even know what that means. So I don't know why we're identifying that way. Um, the question was followed after, what is your name? What is your pronoun? It was followed by, what is your favorite type of pizza topping? So let's not normalize this type of behavior. Um, thank you for your time today. Thank you. Next, next caller, please. Hello, if you could please state your name, where you're from, and provide your three minutes of comments. Caller? Um, and then I also want to echo the sentiments of everyone regarding critical I, race theory. Ma'am, can you please provide your name and the town you're from? We didn't hear that. For some reason, in a number of my students. Okay, do you have your YouTube muted, please? Caller? Is there a caller on the line who can provide their name, where they're from, and provide their comments? Um, the question was followed after, what is your name? What is your pronoun? It was followed by, what is your favorite type of okay. pizza topping? Whoever's on the line, please mute your YouTube, unmute your microphone on your computer. Ending in 8189. Okay. Hi, may I have your name, where you're Hi. from, and your comments, please? Nicole Collars from Brighton, Michigan. And um, I would like to talk about critical race theory and the um, situations in our schools right now. Um, Brighton and most of Livingston County had a professional development day where they learned from 
Horatio Sanchez's The Poverty Problem. And in this, um, on Horatio Sanchez's website, the first thing that he says is a leader, he describes himself as a leader in educational, educational, mental health, and juvenile justice. What in the world does he say is juvenile justice? That is critical race theory. He continues on to talk about how um, children of color are automatically oppressed. And he goes on, continues on to support critical race theory. And that is what our teachers spent the beginning of school learning about. We've also had 18 rogue teachers this year in two schools in Brighton that have implemented critical race theory into their classroom by asking students questions that should not be asked in school. The last thing I want to talk about is masking, vaccinations, and testing. This is all parents' choice. Leave it to the parents. Quarantining is just it's not feasible for families. It's not feasible for students. It's detrimental to education. Please consider these as you make your decisions today. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please. Hello, caller. Please state your name, where you're from, and provide your three minutes of comments. If there are other there are other cultures. Please mute your YouTube. Oh, oh. Name, city, and comments, please. Hi there. Um, my name is Christina Schutz. I am from Clarkston. Um, and I want to start by thanking you um, for the opportunity to speak today. Um, five years ago, my daughter, Sylvia, died in my arms. Um, she was born with severe congenital heart disease, an open heart surgery, which promised a much better prognosis upon its success, did not go as planned. That surgery left her on life support, including a ventilator, an ECMO, much like the ones many kids who are suffering from COVID have experienced. Um, and she was on those for nearly three months while she waited for a heart transplant. She was seven months old when placed on life support and 10 months old when I felt her take her last breath. She was supposed to start kindergarten this year. It's come to my attention that several members on this board feel as if my daughter would not have had the right to go to school. This is perplexing to me considering you are the board of public education in the state of Michigan. Public education, as a rule, is inclusive. Public education, as a rule, promotes education equity. Public education, as a rule, is meant for all children, regardless of race, social status, medical and cognitive disparities, income, etc. The lack of universal masking means Sylvia would not have been able to attend public school. Lack of universal masking means my best friend's son, Abe, who has half of a heart, would not be able to attend public school. It means the one in 100 kids with heart disease, the many with cancer, with organ transplants, and with the reasonable desire to stay as safe as possible, do not have the free opportunity for equal education. You wanna talk about discrimination? The lack of universal masking means you are discriminating against chronically ill children, children who have parents with cancer, or other illnesses, grandparents in nursing homes, children like my older daughter who have medical trauma from watching her baby sister die in the hospital, kids with siblings who are in transplant lists, and those who want to practice rational caution during a global pandemic. Chronically ill children are born fighting for every single breath they take. They should not have to fight to take those breaths in a public school. One of these board members you're constantly minimizing the risks of COVID, comparing them to the risk of a car crash, comparing reasonable methods of mitigating spread to child abuse. 
My daughter's combination of heart defects was the first of its kind. The doctors could not even give me a statistical qualification for the rareness of her condition. Your comments, sir, mean families like mine, families who have lost a child, who have bought a tiny casket in a way that is so statistically unlikely don't matter to you. It means you are willing to sacrifice kids like my daughter on the altar of freedom and politics. You are apathetic to families who have and who will bury their kids who die from COVID. I'm sorry your three minutes is up. Thank you for calling. Thank you. Next caller, please. Next caller, please state your name, where you're from, and provide your comments. Hello? Yes, Have please turn off your YouTube feed. Oh, sorry, I didn't know you were ahead. Okay. Hi, my name is Jennifer Tuxo, and I am from Rochester Hills. My pronouns are she and her. First off, please recommend that all school districts in Michigan require universal masking policies. There are many that are still not requiring masks, such as Romeo and Utica Community Schools. Their vaccine rates are lower, and only about one-third of students are masking up. It is a public health disaster in the making and discriminatory to all those who are relying on a universal masking policy in order to assessly, safely attend in person. And since I mentioned vaccines, they should indeed be mandated for all eligible students and teachers for in-person attendance, period. Also, please ensure that districts cooperate fully with health departments and are following proper contact tracing protocols and informing parents of exposures in a timely manner. We are hearing of several issues in this regard. I also want to voice my support for DEI programs, which have ignorantly come under attack as of late. To all those who oppose diversity, equity, and inclusion programs, please stop. And CRT is not taught in schools. Stop with this notion that they are. CRT is a theory in academia about race that adults use to discuss the context of their environment. It is indeed a graduate level course. And to those who oppose it, please do not begin to pretend to have any understanding of its complexity. It is an absolute myth that critical race theory teaches hatred of white people or that it is designed to perpetuate divisions in American society. What is the purpose of a DEI program? Diversity is the presence of differences that may include race, gender, religion, sexual orientation, ethnicity, nationality, socioeconomic status, language, disability, age, religious commitment, or political perspective. Populations that have been and remain underrepresented and marginalized in the broader society. Equity is promoting justice, impartiality, and fairness within the procedures, processes, and distribution of resources. And tracking equity issues requires an understanding of the root causes of outcome disparities within our society. Inclusion is an outcome to ensure those that are diverse actually feel and are welcomed. Inclusion outcomes are met when you, your institution, and your program are truly inviting to all. That's it. In its simplest explanation, DEI serves to make all students in all of their diverse needs feel welcome in schools and where their individual needs will be met so they can get the full education and support that they need. To oppose DEI portrays a low-level thinking driven by unfounded fears and frankly, manufactured hysteria. The same type of hysteria we're also seeing in regards to masks and vaccines. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please. Please state your name, where you're from, and provide your comments, please. Your name, please, where you're from, and your comments. Start now. Yes, you please start now. What's your name? Where are you from? And then you can provide your comments. Joellen Tazarczyk, Livingston County. Critical race theory is being recommended to Michigan teachers. First, Governor Whitmer's Michigan Blueprint for Comprehensive Student Recovery, May 19th. Read it, folks. Click on the links. There are numerous examples of CRT. One, on page 27, links to a guide, How to Talk with Other Whites About Racism by Dr. Beth Gorilla. Quote, white fragility is an extension of white guilt. White privilege is insidious. All whites benefit from racism. Some people will say all whites are racist as well. Second, 
This April, the Biden Department of Education put out guidelines, including a document from the Abolitionist Teaching Network by Bettina Love and others. Quote, abolitionist work requires solidarity from co-conspirators. It advises, investigate how existing social-emotional learning frameworks are weaponized against black, brown, and indigenous children. Disrupt whiteness and other forms of oppression. There are several demands in this document. For example, reparations for children of color stolen by the school to prison pipeline. Free anti-racist therapy for white educators and support staff. A third example, the American Federation of Teachers and National Education Association publicly support these teachings. NEA Resolution 39, adopted July 21, vowed to disseminate a study that critiques white supremacy, anti-blackness, anti-indigeneity, racism, and other forms of power and oppression at the intersections of our society. Part C of same resolution, the association will convey that in teaching these topics, it is reasonable and appropriate for curriculum to be informed by academic frameworks for understanding and interpreting the impact of the past on current society, including critical race theory. Under C, new business item number two, the NEA supports research into organizations critical of efforts to infuse critical race theory's discriminatory practices into elementary and secondary schools across the country. Critical race theory currently has more names and variants than COVID-19. These include culturally responsive teaching, diversity and equity, inclusion and inclusion, and implicit bias training, among others. Our own state and federal agencies and teacher unions are proponents of this ideology. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please. Please state your name, where you're from, and provide your comments. For understanding and interpreting the impact please of the mute, past on Please mute society, your YouTube connection. Under okay, I'm here. Okay. Yes. Please give me your name and where you're from, and thanks for muting your YouTube, and then you can provide your comments. Okay, um, my name is Jennifer Smith, and I'm from Livingston County, Michigan. Um, I echo every sentiment about the CRT. Um, I have a student in a high school who was asked his pronoun, and then also he was assigned an English uh, comprehensive essay about a girl having an abortion. I think this is completely ridiculous, and you guys need to li literally wake up over there. Um, my comments are going to be a little bit different from everyone else's as I am not citing a specific source. I'm just going to give you my opinion as a parent. I would like one of you board members to please go through this asinine process of requesting to speak to you people and then do this crazy call-in business that we've had to do to jump through hoops. This is asinine. There should be a Zoom link. Secondly, Aside from Ms. Snyder and Mr. McMillan, Mr. Rice or Dr. Rice, seriously, are you, do you even, why are you teaching kindergarten principles to your board? You have to tell them to be nice to each other. I'm a parent. I took my day off of work to be on this meeting. I thought there'd be some critical issues being addressed here, but you're in competent board members have to be told how to be kind to the other board members. And the way Ms. Snyder has been treated is appalling. And to her, I want to say, hang in there because we at Moms for Liberty are 40,000 strong and we're backing you 100%, even if not one other person, but Mr. McMillan in the room is. The rest of you, you need to put your political voices down and be the state school board. I am just disgusted at what I saw on your social media accounts. And if I knew the name right now, I would drop it, but I don't. But all I can say is those of you making fun of your constituents on social media for a difference of opinion is appalling. You should be removed from the board. Why is the superintendent not stepping in to do this? Why are you allowing Ms. Ulrich to instead 
offer an olive branch during the discussion earlier, she throws in Miss Snyder's face more executive protocol. Disgusting. I don't know why she's even sitting at the table with you guys because both her and Mr. McMillan are years ahead of you. The only person I have a positive comment for today is Mr. Strayhorn. What he said was everyone deserves to bring a passion to the game. One thousand percent and not one of you people have it other than those three people that i mentioned miss snyder mr mcmillan and mrs mr strayhorn the rest of you need to check your privilege i don't know what kind of disconnected alter universe you live in but us parents out here are fighting for the right to breathe and be educated by our children and we don't need this crt we don't want your math and i'm tired of your crap Thank you for your Thank you for your comments. Next caller, please. Next caller, name where you're from and provide your comments, please. Caller? Ahead of you. Only person Hello. Hi, please mute your YouTube. Provide your name. I know you you, you you guys are delayed, so just hang in to those people who that are, are on the phone. You guys are delayed, so just hang in to those people who are coming on the call, okay? All May right. May I please have My your name, name is, and where you're from? That's what I'm doing right now. Sheila Great. Cahoon from Clinton Township. I'm Moms for Liberty McComb. Um, McMillan and Schneider, you guys, we're standing with you. We are 40,000 strong across the nation. We have your back, okay? You say follow the science. I'm following the science when I have watched my 76-year-old neighbor get diagnosed with COVID along with other employees at her job when they were all masked up and all gloved up. I'm following the science when I watched my sister, who has diabetes, is overweight, and has asthma get COVID because, and, and she was masked up. I'm following the science by not wearing a mask because it doesn't work. If it worked, none of the friends that I have that were masked up would have gotten COVID. I just, and the numbers wouldn't have skyrocketed last year. <clears throat> I just witnessed today a mother who shared with us um, a document that her daughter got from her school in Warren um, from a teacher where she had her color about kids wearing masks and how to wear them and properly put them on and why you need to wear them. It's propaganda and it needs to stop the indoctrination and propaganda of our little children need to stop. It was the teacher's opinion, and it needs to stop. This teacher needs to be reprimanded. There was a call to unify the country by this president, if that's what you want to call him, um, in his inaugural address. Where, where have we done that? I keep seeing everybody on the school board, elective boards, and all that keep arguing and not being unified and being disrespectful to the other people on the board. We are not showing our children what it is to give grace and patience. I loved that the board member shared about the polio. And you know what? You stated that your family made the decision, not the government and not the school board. Do you think everything that you think and read is correct? Well, so does the other side. And you know what? The, fa the truth will be found in the middle. And when you know that what you are saying is correct, that's called your free will to think and your freedom to think. Lastly, I homeschool my son, and we have been part of this homeschool connection group and High Point High Bay group. You know what? They were unmasked all last year, and they didn't get a single outbreak or a single case in their school. You know, the numbers that you talk about with masking and say, saying that the masks work, that doesn't hold weight. When you have other places that don't mess it up at all and they don't have outbreaks. And by the way, outbreaks are considered one or more cases. So show me the numbers. Lastly, I have pulled my son from the public school system, and that was my choice, my choice as a parent. There isn't a one-size-fits-all for this um, pandemic, whatever you want to call it. The only thing to decide about all of this is to give it to the, to the people to make their own choice. The board is not the government. The board doesn't know what my son has gone through. 
Doing so and giving people the choice will allow people to do what they believe is right for their own body and therefore not discriminating and not segregating. Thank you. Have a great day. Next caller, please. If you'd please state your name, where you're from, and provide your comments, please. Please state your name, where you're from, and provide your comments. Hi, my name is Brittany Senecal. I am from Jackson, Michigan. Um, <clears throat> good afternoon. My name is Brittany Senecal. I am a mother of three and a lifelong Jackson resident. This week, I pulled my son from in-person learning. His school does not have a mask mandate. This was a very hard for my decision for my family, but necessary to keep us safe. <clears throat> my son relies heavily on the public education system due to his autism diagnosis and some physical limitations. Through the ISD, he receives physical, occupational, and speech therapy. Last week, my nephew tested positive for COVID. He caught COVID directly from his unmasked preschool ISD teacher. You can find information on this. Um, it's on the MBHHS website. It's the Jackson County ISD East Campus outbreak. 11 other Jackson County school outbreaks are listed on the website. Jackson County schools are failing to provide safe in-person learning. On August 13th, 2021, Jackson County school superintendent, the Jackson County Health Department, and Mike Shirky met privately to discuss masks in schools. Jackson County parents want to know what political influence there was to not mandate masks in Jackson schools. We need science-based decisions, not political decisions made for our children. Please help Jackson County keep our kids safe in schools. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please. Is there a caller on the line? Please provide your name, where you're from, and your comments. Thank you for calling. Hello. Please provide your Hello. name, where you're from, and provide your comments. Thank you. Hi, this is Desiree Dragon. I'm from White Lake, Michigan. Can you hear me? Not very well. Could you turn up the volume a little bit? Can you hear me now? A little bit better. Hello? A little, a little better. If that's if that's the best it can be, we will... We Here, will... actually... That's great. Can you That's hear me now? Great. Okay, perfect. Um, I'm Desiree Dragon. I'm from uh, White Lake, Michigan. Can you still hear me? Yeah, it's great. Continue. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm a little bit of appalled here that some of these parents and board members um, think that they're, they're doctors and that they're smarter than um, 67,000 pediatricians that belong to the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, do they even know that, sure, kids won't die. You know, a lot of kids won't die. Some have. A lot have, actually. Too many. One is more than enough of COVID. But in Italy, studies show that 40% of children suffer from long COVID. And our country, the United States, is starting to see uh, that number grows substantially because of the Delta variant, since it's 1,200 times the viral load of its origin. There's something called dysautonomia. It's actually something I have. I was diagnosed with it three years ago from another virus called Epstein-Barr. Well, dysautonomia is now being diagnosed in uh, children and adults post-COVID. I'm hooked up to an infusion pump once a week for four hours through a port in my chest to treat, not cure, because there is no cure, my dysautonomia. This type of thing is being diagnosed with children and adults. 52% of teens suffer from long COVID. 13% of children to ages 2 to 11 have long COVID. And the numbers are growing. Okay? 
There's also nothing on the CDC site that says that the flu is more dangerous than COVID. That's a bunch of BS, and they know it, the, those board members that can claim that. Um, I'm also appalled at the fact that people just can't come together and work together for the sake of humanity. They've got to use their children as political pawns and say that they don't like the mask. Well, I've never met a kid that doesn't mind wearing the mask. They don't, they don't mind wearing it because they're helping their fellow American, right? Everybody around them. It's all team effort. Okay. So I'm appalled at anybody that would put their child's life in danger, whether if they're going to die from it or not, or suffer with long COVID, it doesn't matter. The fact is we're in a pandemic. This is a very dangerous virus. And the fact that parents are just putting their children in danger without a mask, just to, just as a political pawn is absolutely disgusting. It is. None of you are doctors. None of you are scientists. None of you devoted any of your life's work to what we're talking and we're dealing with today. None of you have. So don't sit there and act like you're an expert because you're not. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Next caller, please. <laughs> Hello, caller. Can you give us your name, where you're from, and provide your comments, please? Yes. This is Tom Banks. I'm from Petoskey, Michigan. And my comments pertain to the uh, opening comments uh, of this meeting about uh, COVID and the statistics that were quoted. Um, so I think it's important to remember that there's not two groups of people the vaccinated and the unvaccinated. There's three groups of people. It's the vaccinated, the unvaccinated, and those that have survived COVID, which is over 40 million people. Those people have their own uh, natural antibodies, which are more protective than any vaccine. So when we talk about requiring vaccines or masks, uh, it's important to remember that there's 40 million people out there who don't have uh, a need for a vaccine. A vaccine does not help someone who's already got their own antibodies. But more importantly, uh, I looked at the CDC website today, and 99% of all cases now are the Delta variant. And the Delta variant is much less severe than COVID. It's more like a cold and uh, less like the flu-like symptoms of the original COVID. So um, as far as children go, uh, less than one per 100,000 uh, children are hospitalized with COVID or the Delta variant. Uh, so it's, it's a very small number. It's almost close to zero. So what I want to encourage people here is to avoid exaggerating the severity, the danger of COVID. I think we're overreacting and we're causing our children to be afraid unnecessarily, which I think is actually the reason why a lot of people want masks because it's a constant reminder that you need to be afraid. We should not be afraid. Um, and that's my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please. Hi, next caller, please. I think you may have your YouTube yep. feed on. If you can yep, please I'm turn here. that off. Yep, I'm here. Thanks. Can you give can you us your name? Yes. Can you please give us your name, where you're from, and provide your comments? Yes, my name is Sally Roser. I am from Traverse City, and I would like to respond to the uh, worst and scariest statistics that you could find to open your meeting with. Um, everybody has statistics to support their argument. I'm looking at um, CDC information that shows that there have been no deaths in Michigan for people under the age of 17 years old. Um, and then there, it is also um, 
have been shown that uh, over 4.2 million kids have tested positive for COVID. 0.008% of them have died. Um, the CDC estimates that 480 kids died of the flu in the 2018-2019 season. That's more than have died in COVID in an entire year and a half. I don't remember anybody asking for people to mask to prevent the flu, or is that coming down the path? I'm not sure. The WHO just, or the WHO just came out with a statement that said that this, um, that COVID will continue to mutate every year, just like the flu. So I want to know what the end game is. Are we going to continue to mask forever? Um, I don't want to see any more studies because sincerely, I, I don't think that most of us are going to ever be gaslighted into believing that you're stopping the spread by wearing a mask into a restaurant and taking it off two minutes later when you sit down. It only takes a five-year-old to look around at this circus and realize that it's all a joke. Um, even on the side of the box of masks that they're handing out in school, it says this does not stop the spread of COVID-19. It is just garbage. I don't know when we're going to be able to make these choices for our own children. We don't want masks on them. Um, continuing on, I had a friend uh, last week who is seventh grader, came home from school and said their teacher uh, asked him to um, list his pronouns. Why are we asking seventh graders what sex they are? It's not appropriate. It's not okay to ask our kids if they might be another sex other than what we currently know them to be. Talking to a child about their sex, personal sex, is a violation of privacy and really borders on sexual abuse to minors. Uh, as far as um, CRT, you may say it's not being taught in schools, but our school district spent $20,000 to pay Justice Leaders Collaborative to offer teacher training, which promotes actively prioritizing interests of BIPOC students over white students, encouraging, uh, it encourages people to notice skin color and patterns based on skin color, demoralizes the ideas of American exceptionalism, one human race, color blindness, color blindness and meritocracy. We've got to stop this. We're not going to allow it in our schools. Uh, we are in the middle of a lawsuit in our county right now against our school. This is absolutely absurd. These are government schools. Nobody's trusting the government right now. I don't know. Nobody can trust a government school with our children, and that's why we're fighting back. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Next caller, please. Can you please provide your name, where you're from, and your comments? Yes, Joel Ruhlman. I'm from Macomb, Michigan. Uh, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, please continue. Thank you. Um, thanks for letting me talk this afternoon. I've been... Uh, following the meeting most of the day. Um, first of all, it's extremely appalling um, how most of the members are treating the minority in the group. Um, and I'm here to tell you, let's be honest, you, you're going to get it from the callers today. And all, you're seeing it at the school board meetings across the, the state and the country that the, minor, the minority truly isn't, the minority is the people that want to force our kids to wear masks. The majority are for choice, and you're seeing that today. Now, what you guys represent, the six of you, whatever, I'm, you know what, I'm going to give um, Jason some credit uh, because he's been a very fair-minded individual there today, and I commend him for that. But the rest of you, the way you treat uh, Mr. McMillan and Ms. Snyder is absolutely pathetic. I mean, zero respect. And you guys don't realize, but the majority of this country side with those two. You are the minority of this group. And, you know, it's enough enough. There, there's science on all sides of this debate. But science doesn't matter here. It's politics now. It's all politics. Everybody's politics is mixed in with this virus now, which was the worst thing that could ever happen. And we're never going to agree on the science. But you know what? It's our choice to raise our children the way we want to raise our children. And it's not yours. So please stop trying to tell us how to teach our, how to, what to do with our kids. 
there, I, I'm personally am vaccinated. My wife is as well, but I will not put that needle in my children's arms. Why would I do that? You know, we t- you, I heard you talk about the polio vaccine earlier. It would, the polio vaccine took like 30 years to develop. We developed this in a matter of months and you're, you're trying to, and it's trying to be sold to us that, oh, this is, this is great. You know, let's get everybody vaccinated. Oh, next, let's do it to our kids. Come on now. This is, it's, this is getting in, out of control. You, you, this, this board is out of control. I'm happy to see a, a couple of you are up for election coming up next year. And I hope that, you know, we're able to vote you out because, um, you know, you're not, you're not that with reality and that's, there's no other way to say it, but thanks for letting me talk. Thank you. Next caller, please. Next caller, please. Thanks for calling. May I have your name, where you're from, and your comments, please? Hi, um, I'm Terry Z, and I'm from Oakland County, Michigan. I just wanted to voice support for universal masking and mitigation in public schools. Masking and mitigation is the right thing to do, and we need to do everything in our power to keep our children safe and out of the hospitals. As this board is well aware, there is no one-to-one ratio of children to doctors or for adults to doctors. And we are seeing around the country, doctors and nurses begging for help and asking the community to please listen. States that fly in the face of science are now begging for federal help and using taxpayer money to cover this abandonment of safe adherence to just requests and guidelines from the scientific community. And there's this crazy group of parents and politicians that say follow the money and behave recklessly against the pleas of public health epidemiologists and doctors. And yet where do they go when they get COVID to the doctor? And they right now think that they are beating the pandemic when really it's the people who are getting vaccinated and masking that are trying to get in front of this thing. We have the data. It's in favor of masks and vaccines. Sorry. For schools that want to stay open, they must mask and mitigate universally. Staying healthy and in school is our common goal. Any comment to the contrary is wasting the time of parents across our state where other very important decisions need to be made regarding a multitude of public education concerns. Schools have a lot of challenges to tackle, not just COVID. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. This concludes public participation for the State Board of Education meeting. All the callers who pre-registered and are on the line have been given an opportunity to speak. Thank you for providing your public comments. Thank you. We are at the uh, point in our board agenda board where we're going to be approving minutes of the regular and committee the whole meeting of August 10th, 2021. May I please have a motion to approve these meeting minutes? So moved. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Support. So, so I have a, a motion from President Albridge, support from uh, Mr. Strayhorn. Any discussion? I'd like to propose an amendment. Okay. And On um, page nine, after the 70th call, I'd like to say that uh, at the time there was um, approximately 25 people waiting to be heard uh, that were in line, online, that were online or waiting to be heard. I can clarify that if you need me to. Geez, sorry. I think it's the first time we did it. I think it's important. So that's my motion. Support. So we have a, we have a motion and a second to amend the meeting minutes on page nine to include that there were people waiting um, approximately 25. Uh, can, can I, I don't over? recall 25 people waiting on at any given time. On the okay, a large number because there was a large number. I can change it to there was 
a large number of people waiting to be heard. Okay, so so we have a we have a motion. Second. Second. Um, discussion. Uh, I I don't mind saying that there are people waiting to be heard, but I, if we're going to do that, then I think we also need to include the fact that none of this followed our bylaws and, and folks that were waiting to be heard. Anyone who was who spoke at public comment and had pre-registered, like all of these folks today, were heard. Um, so if we're going to start adding that type of information, then we're going to have to start adding additional information, such as <coughs> we allowed, uh, what, like 50 people who had not pre-registered to speak. You can make that motion, I guess. I'll so, just vote no on yours. So, I, either so, way, it's so we have a, we have a motion. We have a second. We're in the midst of discussion. Um, I do not hear a, a motion off the motion. Is that right? Uh, at this time, no. Okay, fair enough. So we have a motion on the table from Mr. McMillan, seconded by Ms. Snyder. Um, discussion from President Albrich, other board members. Uh, discussion on the motion, not the minutes, but the motion. Hearing none, if we could have a roll call vote, please. No, no. Ellen has a question. I beg your pardon. Oh, I beg your pardon, Ellen. My bad. Okay. No, no. The uh, the question I have is so I just want to make sure the motion that we're voting on is that it says that there were twenty five people waiting number. or okay so a, a large number and how are we defining a large number are we leaving that undefined. Well, it, I remember there was approximately 25, and somebody else that was here in the room said there was about 25. But uh, if that's not desired, I think uh, a large number is is fine. I mean, that's my okay. Motion. So I guess you can vote it down. It's okay. I just want to make sure. So it's set, the the motion is that there was a large number of people. Yes. An undefined, but you're not defining a large number. Okay. Thank you. Okay, and and remind us. Uh, Marilyn, if you would, please, is there a reference to the three hours of public comment? Mm -hmm. oh. Yes. It was, it's, uh, it says Ms. Ellen Lipton called for a point of order, noting that the board's bylaws state that the public comment will last for one hour. She said for this meeting only, she's proposing that there be a time limit of two hours and 55 minutes. Okay. Uh, right. She said that the limit will be reached in 55 seconds. 55 seconds. seconds. Okay. All right, very good. Um, other, thank you, Ms. Lipton. Other, um, other comments. I'm looking at. Um, I'm looking Dr. at Hughes. page page two, um, and I, I I can't remember, but I, I don't know that, that that I ever made a motion. Um, I didn't think that I did. Uh, that the state board of education had a mask mandate resolution to the agenda. I thought we were discussing it, and I asked for the best way to go about. I, that's my recollection as well. Um, so I, I don't know. I don't know that I withdrew a motion. I thought that I asked if I should make a motion or if, if or if I could make an amendment. I think that's how we have a we have a motion on the table. Um, we can certainly address that. But I, I'd like okay. to I'd like yes. to consider yes. the the first motion to amend oh, the sorry, meeting minutes. That. Yeah, okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. No, it's all good. Um, but we will that we're coming back to that okay. after this vote. Okay. Um, anything more on this particular amendment to the minutes? Hearing none, if we could do a roll call vote. Lipton? No. McMillan? Yes. Pritchett? No. Pugh? No. Snyder? Yes. Strayhorn? No. Tilly? No. Albridge? No. Motion fails. Okay. So we, um, we still have the consideration of the uh, meeting minutes as originally drawn. Dr. Pugh, to you. Um, I would like to move to amend the last um, uh, item on page two. Um, I don't recall making the motion. Okay, yeah, that's not a motion. Yeah, my, may I speak? Please. My recollection is that um, the conversation included um, the reminder that in the past we have amended um, motions or resolutions, uh, and therefore that could be um, a mechanism for Dr. Pugh to use. 
Can I speak? Uh, Ms. Snyder, please. Um, when we were talking about large number and defining it, I don't think that we had proof of that, right? Like we all had seen a screen on some level, but in this instance, we have we can go back, right, and and hear the words and see the video. We could. So maybe we shouldn't be um, amending minutes when there's. I mean, we should look into it, but I don't know that unless we have the proof to support it, that it shouldn't necessarily just be changed. So, so there was a name. I'm, I'm please, trying to help. Yeah. yeah, so I guess, uh, yeah, so we had already voted to put the anti-mask mandate and the other two on, and then you might have said, actually, I want a mask mandate, and so, mm -hmm. and then maybe and I think there doesn't look like there was a second, so maybe you said, oh, never mind. We'll, we'll uh, amend. Mm -hmm. the, yeah. yeah. I think you. So I think there, was, I there was some measure of informality to it, and I also don't think that there was a, a motion available at the moment. Yeah, I didn't I think move. it was in I the moment. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. So, uh, so I would recommend that the board strike this <clears throat> from its consideration of the draft meeting minutes. I support that. So uh, I'm going to take it as a motion from Dr. Pugh, a second from uh, President Albrecht, and then um, any discussion thereon? Okay. Any disagreement associated there therewith? I think it's a friendly amendment to the maker of the original uh, uh, I motion. Think, yeah, I think, I think as yeah. well. Okay. Any other recommended amendments to the um, meeting minutes? If not, if we could have a vote on the base minutes as amended. By her, by her amendment, but not my amendment. We are well, your amendment, your amendment was voted on. Right. Your amendment was no, voted on. No, no, I know. We're right. just voting mm -hmm. right. That's right. on the base. Yeah. It, it's the, it's right. the base minus the line. Right. Yeah. yeah. Ready? Lipton? Yes. McMillan? No. Pritchett? Yes. Hugh? Yes. Snyder? Abstain. Strayhorn? Yes. Tilly? Tilly? Uh, Tilly's muted. Ms. Tilly, are you there for a vote? Want me to move on? Albridge? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. We're at that point in the meeting where we hear the report of the president, Dr. Albridge. Thank you very much. Let me just pull this up here. Uh, I just have a very quick um, report. Uh, Pam and I had the pleasure of visiting with Kathy Strauss, former president of the State Board of Education, um, who looks very, uh, very good and is doing really wonderful. And um, it was great to, to get to see her again. We also, as part of that, uh, we're celebrating Michelle Fecto. Uh, you may have heard um, that Michelle is uh, receiving an upcoming award from NASB, the Distinguished Service Award. Uh, she was nominated by this board, and we're really excited that she was one of the, she is one of the recipients. I can't think of anyone more deserving of this award than Michelle Fecto. You know, her and her husband have devoted their entire lives to serving children. They've taken in about 20 kids. Uh, I'm sure more at this point. Adopted um, them, not just taking them in. I mean, exactly. Like most of them well, and in. now they're bringing in children of children that they've adopted. So. Um, in, in addition to raising uh, biological children with special needs as well. So um, this is just a, a really exciting moment for us. And she was so honored and so pleased and couldn't thank the board enough for this great honor. So if, if you haven't already, um, the NASB conference will be virtual again this year. It's October 6th through 8th. Um, please let Marilyn know if you're interested in attending. We don't know yet exactly the timing of the award ceremony, but I definitely plan to be there and hope that uh, you can make it as well. So um, that's all I, I needed to say. Thank you. Thank you, President Albrecht. And, and my report is simply to echo the congratulations to Michelle, who's 
an outstanding uh, citizen and a, was a tremendous board member during her tenure on the board. At this point, we're at the report of the Teacher of the Year. Uh, Ms. Leah Porter, the 2021-2022 Michigan Teacher of the Year, will present her report. Ms. Porter is a third grade teacher at Wilcox Elementary School and Holt Public Schools. Ms. Heather French, Region 1 Teacher of the Year from Lake Linden Hubble Schools in the Upper Peninsula is joining us virtually. She teaches art to students in young fives through 12th grade and English language arts to students in seventh grade through 10th grade. Teachers of the Year, welcome. It is a pleasure to have you today. Thank you, and thank you for um, being able to be a part of this group all morning and getting to spend my first full day with you on the Board of Education. So uh, Ms. Heather French, who is Region 1 Teacher of the Year, is uh, lives in the UP, and she is nine and a half hours away, so she is coming to us remotely today. Heather, I don't know if you can hear us. Are you on? Gonna give her a moment in case she's unmuting. Heather, are you there? I'm here. Hi. All right. Hi. <laughs> so um, Heather is actually going to begin. She's going to be doing her presentation first, and I'll be kind of guiding the way on that, Heather. So um, whenever you're ready, uh, take it away. All right. Thank you so much. I'm Heather French. I am a teacher at Lake Linden Hubble Schools. I teach every grade, young five through 12th, uh, art and, and seventh and 10th grade English. Um, I'm going to toot my own horn for a second because I do have a point. I was the 2007 Michigan Tech Student Teacher of the Year, the 2015 uh, Parent Advisory Council Outstanding General Education Teacher of the Year. In 2018, I was the 110th district, that's Greg Markinen's Teacher of the Year, and this past year, the Region 1 Teacher of the Year. Region 1 encompasses the entire Upper Peninsula, so I am representing the whole 906. Leah, you can go ahead and click. <laughs> so... I want to bring attention to the Upper Peninsula because I've been listening to the meeting today and listening to parents, constituents, people of the board, and our trip to Lansing was eye-opening. I will admit I'm almost 40 and I had never been to our state capitol before, but being there really made me realize how very little the UP is considered by the Lower Peninsula. Um, while we were standing in the Department of Education lobby, someone said to us, an administrator, you're basically Canada. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> uh, we, we are not really a forethought to the Lower Peninsula. We're like a resource. We're a vacation destination. But interestingly enough, you know, K.I. Sawyer is producing huge amounts of medical uh, equipment for organs, 12 miles from my home, they are building rockets. Orbion Space Corporation is in Houghton, Michigan, and they have been hit up by Silicon Valley. Why are you not here? Because I'm just as close to space from Houghton, Michigan, as I would be in Silicon Valley. We have wonderful things in the Upper Peninsula. Northern Michigan University was named the 20th best university in the Midwest, ahead of University of Michigan and MSU. We have wonderful resources here, and I feel like we are ignored. We are vastly ignored, and that's something that needs to be changed. The UP needs to be on your radar. We have kids that are producing amazing things. We have awesome teachers up here. We need to tap into not only the education, but also the wonderful things that the UP can provide. We go ahead and click, Leah. So while I was downstate, I, I won't lie, by the time I got home, I was mad because the map you're seeing on the right was pretty much all we saw in ads. The UP wasn't even represented. Mountain Dew left us off. We're left off on weather maps all the time. We're added in as part of Wisconsin or Canada, but we are here. There's about 80,000 students in the, in the UP that are not represented or not even thought about 
by the board and the Lower Peninsula. And that makes me so sad. But my biggest problem, go ahead and click, Leah. Dr. Rice asked us when we had our meeting this summer to think about how we could positively influence college-bound students to go into the education uh, practice, how we can get people to be Michigan educators strong. And here's my concern. When we went downstate and we started talking, um, teachers in Lansing, Michigan, that have the exact same credentials I do, the exact same amount of time in that I do, are making $27,000 more than their UP counterpart. How can I tell one of my students, yes, please go into the education practice when we have such a massive pay gap? They want to stay up here because they love the way of life. They love the feeling up here, the sense of community. We are really strongly bonded up here. Being part of the 906 really means something. But how can I tell them, yes, go do this when you're not going to make nearly as much money as anyone in the Lower Peninsula? And to be honest, after after I was in Lansing and I, I felt so brokenhearted about the way we were treated and how I felt, I contacted my Senator, Ed McBroom, and he said, that is nothing new. That's why young people or even people my age are leaving and they're not going downstate. They're going to Wisconsin. They're going to the Dakotas. They're going to Montana. We are actively driving people out of the UP and not to the Lower Peninsula. So we really need to work on this massive gap that we have to make it equitable so that teachers are making somewhere in the same range. $27,000 is a huge amount of money. That That's too much. $2,700 I can, I can reconcile with, but $27,000, that's insanity. Go ahead and click, Leah. So again, here, here's my map. I'm way up here at the very tippy top in the Keweenaw Peninsula. It took us about nine hours to come down to you folks, hence my not being there today, because that would mean two days off of school for me on top of this meeting day. Go ahead and click again. And one other thing I wanted to highlight, please, that we keep in mind as things happen with COVID and uh, the, the Delta variant, everything that we're facing right now, um, Students having access to the internet. I advocated for broadband internet services across the UP uh, through Governor Whitmer's office this summer. And this was released recently about how internet services were going to be provided to the UP. Huge sections of the UP aren't even included in 2023 of having broadband internet services. So if anything were to happen where schools are shutting down, students need to access remotely, we don't have the capabilities up here and that's not acceptable. We are not serving our students the way they need to be served and we need to advocate that our students get what they need. And internet service is a necessity. So we really need to make sure this is on our radar and it's something we help provide our students with. That's all I have for you. Thank you so much. Thank you for letting me talk and I'll hand things back over to Leah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heather. Um, I know just with getting to know you the last few months, uh, what you've already shared and taught me about the Upper Peninsula and thinking about equity for education is, you know, I'm just glad that we have your voice to continue to advocate for your the community of the Upper Peninsula. So thank you so much. So I am going to also talk a little bit about educational equity today, just from a, a little bit of a different lens. Um, and I'm going to share, I'm going to kind of lean into something that I'm feeling a little vulnerable about. And I think I, I talked a little bit about that the last time that I was here, that um, I tend to want to be a workhorse and not somebody that likes to really present myself out there. But um, in this role, I'm especially feeling empowered myself to lean into the things I care about and to advocate specifically for students in the state. So um, I'm going to share with you a project that is very dear to my heart. And um, I've been working on developing this project for about a year now. And it truly has taken me on a uh, professional journey that has just been one of the best of my career. So educational equity for myself is the highest standard that I strive for in the classroom daily. 
For years, my idea of educational equity was the continuous goal of providing high quality learning experiences that were representative of all students. For years, I felt proud of that work and tried my best each and every day to fulfill that goal. Over the last few years, as I've continued to reflect upon my own teaching and my own learning and uh, striving to continue to grow as a professional educator, I have um, kind of started to shift my idea and understanding of what educational equity really means and really thinking about how, first and foremost, so much of that is rooted in our, the social justice that we are surrounded with. So this definition here comes from the Great Lakes Equity Center, thinking about educational equity. And the wording of this really encapsulates so much of what I feel is critical in educating youth. So I'm just going to read it just for everybody that's listening that can also hear it. I don't really love reading off slides, but in purposes of this, I think it's important. When educational policies, practices, interactions, and resources are representative of, constructed by, and responsive to all people such that each individual has access to, can meaningfully participate, and make progress in high-quality learning experiences that empowers them toward self-determination and reduces disparities and outcomes, regardless of individual characteristics and cultural identities. And there's so much in this that is so loaded for me, but one of the pieces that stood out for me so much as we're thinking about the, the teaching force in this state and wanting to diversify that is that we have, that we are, that things are represented and constructed by, right? We want our educational staff to mirror the students in this state. Um, that piece really speaks to me so much. And then the idea of that we are empowering students towards self-determination and reducing disparities and outcomes, regardless of individual characteristics and cultural identities. It, to me, when I hear that, I think to myself, what if we saw children so deeply to their core? What kind of educational experiences could we provide for them? So I'm just going to take a few moments and share today just one tiny piece of educational equity that I have been working on and feel so deeply passionate about. So as part of my district's equity and access team, we have been analyzing and examining our own systems for student success and achievement. And we know that many students are not accessing the same resources and opportunities at the secondary levels. This is not just an issue in my district, but a trend that is everywhere. The discussion has come around time and time again about how we do empower students to shoot for their dreams while simultaneously providing the support and leadership skills needed. Our ultimate goal has been to prioritize building leaders and competent critical thinkers who will be strong voices and caring citizens in our community. This work is essential to K-12 students with the goal of creating systems of experiences for all students to learn, practice, and implement skills that encourage confidence, competence, and independence into adulthood. First and foremost, students need the autonomy to feel seen and represented in their learning on a daily basis. And as I had told you before, as a literacy teacher, I embed books everywhere. Um, this is one, All Are Welcome, a beautiful story for primary learners. Um, and there's a quote there that goes along with it. But when I think about that word empowerment, um, empowering students, what does that really mean? And the idea of empowering students for me is twofold. And this quote by Bell Hooks really uh, speaks to, to what I'm going to share right now. Teachers must be both the model and the guide to help students explore, create, and develop an understanding and application of a variety of skills that build empowerment. If teachers are unwilling to be vulnerable themselves, it makes it impossible for many students to feel the safety of taking risks in their learning. And so I feel that myself too as I'm leaning into things that might feel challenging for me, but as a model for not only my students, but um, any students that are feeling that those same vulnerabilities. So, the discussions that I've had with my equity and access team um, have led to the understanding for us in our district for a critical need for intentional instruction of character and leadership lessons at the elementary level. When we are examining the access that students had to leadership opportunities, especially in the secondary levels, we realize that first and foremost, we must explore these traits and attributes with all students. And we really needed to be reflective on who was having the opportunities to become leaders. And 
in the, in the ability to provide a trajectory and path of understanding on how to utilize these traits for self-advocacy and their secondary experiences and to help guide them into the career paths or trajectory that they wanted their lives to go. So over the last year, I have worked with a variety of invested teachers and educational staff who have lent their eyes, ears, thoughts, and experiences to the development of these character and leadership lessons. And all of these lessons um, strive to embed the following things. So the first says mindful and systematic lessons, but really that is that we work together as a team to build common language that students would hear, practice, and would have embedded experiences within that are developmentally appropriate, and that these lessons and elements of these lessons were developed by a diverse group of educators across the K-12 um, areas in my district. Um, by talking about those critical skills, we prioritize leadership and character skills we felt were the most urgent and aiding students to find their own voice and develop empathy and strive for advocacy and perseverance in their own lives. And currently, we have completed all the empathy lessons for K-4, which I feel so passionate about and excited just to share just the tiniest bit with you today. We're also working on advocacy, celebrating differences, and inspiring others or in development along with courage and perseverance, depending upon grade. The piece that I feel that I think is the most essential component to these lessons that we have been developing, though, is that they are created around stories and text that ensure representation of students. This component by far has been the most challenging in the fact of finding the best text to use, but it's also been the most rewarding. I have been on an incredible journey with my school librarian as we have combed through hundreds and hundreds of books. Um, to find what we thought would be the best ones to use. As a literacy teacher especially, I find so much value in teaching those skills all around text. Um, in examining a variety of text, um, we also wanted to ensure that we were including authors from historically underrepresented groups and that each student would see themselves within the pages of the books that we were sharing. I just want to say a little side note, I am working right now with third graders uh, doing reading support across my grade as this role has not allowed me to be fully in my classroom as I'm taking on the role of teacher of the year. So I've had the honor of being able to work closely with students one-on-one -on -one and the, our neediest readers across my grade. And I had a, a, a beautiful student in front of me the other day and I'd given her a book and she, she looked at it and she said, "This she looks like me. And it was her hair and everything matched. And we had this conversation and she was telling me all about this character and how she connected with her. And it's so important for young children to see themselves in the pages of the books that are being read to them. So that piece of it has been the biggest and most important piece of this work. So um, I just had this piece here. I, I don't know if you know Goldie Muhammad's work. I'm sure some of you on the board do. But her uh, book, Cultivating Genius, I should have brought my copy up. You would see it's totally destroyed with all the notes and everything. But this, tech, uh, this quote really, for me, uh, embraces the idea of literacy and what it can do to bring voice for students which is engage students with texts that create social action and cause them to think differently as a result of what they read. Create an environment that affords students the opportunity to shape their own ideas through acts of literacy. And what I really find so valuable and important is helping students to be able to find texts that they can connect with and shine with and learn and grow and, and, and identify with. And so um, a few of the books that we use in the empathy lessons, and I brought them today if any of you are interested in looking at them. This one is a kindergarten text in, in those lessons called Words in Your Heart. It's a beautiful story about words of love and compassion and heart-piercing words and how those impact our heart in the ways that we communicate and, and speak to each other. And then in tandem, this one is called Woke, a Young Poets called The Justice, which is a beautiful book of poetry on all different pieces. The, the, poet, the poem about empathy in this book really helps to provide a rich discussion for students on the difference between empathy versus sympathy and, and how crucial it is to understand that. It's called I've Been There Before. Um, I won't read it right now because of time. But along with all the text, we were very mindful to provide engaging experiences for students to, to wrap themselves and embed themselves in the idea of empathy. And these are just a few examples. On the left here are some of the words from Words in Your Heart, where uh, the visual of the heart-piercing words versus the words of love and compassion. Kindergartners could make their own posters that they could place around their classroom or in their building. 
The middle piece is a third grade activity and the book is called The Perfectly Perfect Wish by Lisa Manchev, beautiful story. But it's about establish, establishing an I wish you knew box in the classroom where students would have the opportunity to share things they would want their teacher to know and they could share if they wanted to talk about it with the teacher. They didn't want to talk about it or if they wanted to bring it up in a classroom community discussion um, as something that was that was striking to their heart. And then the last piece here is a fourth grade activity that we developed called The Dots That Connect Us. And it's uh, inspired by the book, Thank You, Mr. Felker by Patricia Polacco. And it's really about helping students see that um, even though um, we might not know it, how we're connected in different ways, and the kids would put dots on different um, posters that would identify things about them. That one says, lost of a grandparent, they would put a sticker up there. Kids would do, uh, every child would have the opportunity to fill in their identity through there, and then there could be discussions around, you know, even though we might not all look the same, act the same, that we have so many things that connect us. So with that, I just want to leave you with this last piece that um, just, again, I when I lean into the work that I'm going to do this year, I pretty much put my whole heart out into the things that I do. And so um, this, to me, is what encapsulates so much of myself as an educator. And um, I just feel that this work is so essential um, for all students to be seen, heard, and given the opportunity to discover themselves. One thing I know for sure, though, is that the learning that I've done, the reflection, and the difficult but really rich conversations I've had over the last several years um, have helped to develop this work in its current form. But I do know that this work for myself, and I think for many educators, is never ending. And I know more today than I knew yesterday, and I know will know far more tomorrow than I do now. So um, to teach in a manner that respects and cares for the souls of our students is essential if we are to provide the necessary conditions where learning can most deeply and intimately begin. And I truly believe that the work of teaching to the souls of all students is truly the path and the responsibility of every educator. So I thank you for your time, and that's all I have. Thank you very much, Ms. French and Ms. Porter. Ms. French, for lifting up the Upper Peninsula. Ms. French, for lifting up the Upper Peninsula and its 80,000 students. Ms. Porter, for lifting up the value of diversity in our teaching profession, diversity in our literacy and in our literature as well. We look forward to your contributions throughout the, uh, the school year. Thank you so much. Thank you. The next item on today's agenda is the approval of Michigan out-of-school time standards of quality. Michigan out-of-school time standards of quality were presented to the State Board of Education on June 8, 2021, which was followed by a period of public comment through July 9, 2021. The standards were presented to the board on August 10th, and revisions have been made based on board member comments. These standards would replace the standards approved by the board in 2013. Today, the board is being asked to approve the standards. Pending board approval, technical assistance will be provided to the before, after, out of school time and summer learning fields by the Office of Preschool and Out of School Times Learning to support programming to align with the new standards. Presenters are Dr. Scott Kennigschnecht, Deputy Superintendent of P20 System and Student Transitions, and Mr. Richard Lauer. Director of Preschool and Out of School Time Learning. There will be a PowerPoint presentation. Gentlemen, good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Eisen. Thank you, and uh, thank you to the State Board for allowing us to come before you this afternoon to seek approval for Michigan's Out of School Time standards. Uh, we have been before you as a board um, recently, and I'm joined by Richard Lauer to uh, talk about uh, some of the edits that Dr. Rice mentioned uh, based upon feedback we received uh, after the last meeting. So Richard, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you once again uh, for having us come before you to present revisions to the most standards, Michigan out of school time, standards of quality, written and informed by an external stakeholders group um, that we had facilitated by the Michigan After School Partnership on our behalf. Just as a reminder um, for clarity, the primary purpose of the, of the standards is to help and assist schools and other organizations in developing high quality comprehensive out of school time programs for all children and youth in grades uh, K through 12. Since last month, 
when we were before you, uh, my staff and I took the opportunity to reflect upon additional input um, and made two additional edits um, from the proposal that was before you last month to the one that you had before you this month uh, that we are presenting for adoption and approval. The first, as you see on the screen here, um, is presented in the previous versus the new proposed version is related to um, addressing the concern of the fact that standards um, and as a whole that not every standard can be met every single moment of every single day of the year. So it's difficult to believe that any and all standards must be met every single standard within the document at all times or programs are out of compliance. Given this, uh, therefore, knowing the goal of the standards are to drive quality in particular within realities of control, in particular local control we of programs, we adjusted the language to state that they must follow these standards to the extent practicable. The second adjustment to the standards was uh, under a specific um, standard and that is on page seven programs following the National After School Association Healthy Eating and Physical Activity or HEPA standards for our school time. The previous uh, version in August uh, specified only whole grains and after further discussion with the writing group of the Michigan After School Partnership we reflected and we struck the word only from that particular standard so that it's offering whole grains as deter uh, determined by confirming that the first item listed. So those were the two uh, modifications since last month before you that we wanted to propose that we felt were reasonable. We took them back to the writing group and for further comment from the stakeholders, they supported those two adjustments based on the additional feedback from this body and from the writing group. With that, this completes the update since last month's state board meeting and my team and I asked for consideration for adoption of this newly revised proposal based on that. Thank you very much, you. Dr. Kennedy, Mr. Lauer, uh, for that uh, brief presentation. Um, may I please have a motion to approve the standards as amended? So moved. I have a motion from Dr. Pritchett. Do I have a second? Support. Support from uh, Dr. Pugh. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, any discussion? Uh, Mr. McMillan. Yeah. I, uh, had opposed it last time. I still think there are some issues with it, and I also have uh, concerns with the SEL portion of this. I've said in the past uh, the, intrusive, the intrusive nature of SEL and getting into families and personal things that uh, I think are inappropriate, and especially Castle um, being referenced as a as a resource. I, I have serious concerns about that organization as well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Any, uh, any other um, elements in discussion? If not, uh, Marilyn, if you could take a roll call vote, please. Lipton? Yes. McMillan? No. Pritchett? Yes. Pugh? Yes. Snyder? Absolutely. No. Okay. Um, Ms. Snyder did leave the meeting, and she is joining and can participate in discussion. But virtual participation it, for a voting purpose under the Open Meetings Act is not allowed for Ms. Snyder at this time due to no medical condition. Strayhorn? Yes. Tilly? Tilly is absent. Albrich? Yes. Five ayes. Motion carries. Thank you. The next item on today's agenda is approval of State Board of Education meeting schedule for 2021. Thank you, presenters. Thank you. State Board Executive has proposed a meeting schedule for 2022. The regular meetings are scheduled for the second Tuesday of each month, except the November meeting is the third Tuesday to avoid Election Day. The Board's work session is scheduled for the third Tuesday in May. The Board is being asked to approve the 2022 State Board of Education meeting schedule today. May I please have a motion to approve the regular meeting schedule 
of 2022. Moved by Mr. McMillan. Supported by Dr. Pugh. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Marilyn, if you would be kind enough to take a roll call vote. Lipton? Yes. McMillan? Yes. Pritchett? Yes. Pugh? Yes. Snyder on the line, but marked absent. Strayhorn? Yes. Tilly? Absent. Albrich? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. The next agenda item is an approval of Camp Tuzmahita spending plan for fiscal year 2021-2022. Michigan School for the Blind Trust Fund Committee met on August 26th, 2021. Ms. Nikki Snyder represents the board on the Trust Fund Committee. The committee reviewed the Camp Tuzmahita spending plan for fiscal year 2021-2022. The board is being asked to approve the spending plan during today's meeting. Ms. Snyder, do you have anything you would like to say about this item before I introduce the presenters? I do not, just that I support it. And if I could vote, I would say yes. Okay, very good. Thank you so much. Presenters are Dr. Scott Kenichnick, back by popular demand, Ms. Roxanne Balfour, Director of Low Incidence Outreach in the Office of Special Education, Ms. Jill Teagarden, Director of Camp Tasmahita, and Ms. Michelle Wolf, I'm thinking, uh, hello there, um, Financial <laughs> Manager for Low Incidence Outreach. You, you know something, even state superintendents can count to four. <laughs> um, presenters, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Rice. And again, thank you, State Board, for allowing us some time to seek approval uh, for the spending plan for Camp T, but also um, to spend a little bit of time to talk about all the great things that are going on there for the kids and families that we serve. So as Dr. Rice said, uh, on August 26th, the Michigan School for the Blind Trust Fund Committee met. Uh, we went over the spending plan. Uh, Board Member Snyder attended, so thanks to Nikki for that. Um, and today I'm joined by Roxanne Balfour, Jill Teagarden, and Michelle Wolf to talk more specifically about the spending plan and also um, uh, just as importantly, all of the great things that are happening for children and families uh, uh, at the camp. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Roxanne. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, everyone, for having us today. We appreciate it. Um, this year was definitely challenging um, for us at camp because it's usually an in-person activity that we have with all these great pictures. So some of the pictures you see are from prior camp, but a lot of them we actually had parents taking pictures for us. So, Camp, for those of you who are new or haven't been there before, and I think, uh, Nikki, I thank you for coming and visiting us out there. That was a great experience. You got to firsthand go through the trails and uh, visit Camp, and, and we, we are so happy with your support. The same thing with Scott. Scott's a big supporter of Camp T as well. So we used to be School for the Blind. We are now Low Incidence Outreach. And part of School for the Blind in 74, the superintendent of the school is the one that actually created Camp Tusmahita for kids who are blind, visually impaired. Since that time, it has evolved to become a youth education facility, still with a focus on students who are blind, visually impaired. And also because we serve those students who are deaf, hard of hearing, we have made several camps for them. We are here to actually have the budget reviewed, but I thought it would be really good for you to know a little bit about camp and what Jill and her creative science teacher side of things did for our students while we were doing COVID and the families to bring them together during this time. Yep. Thanks, Roxanne. My name is Jill Teagarden. I'm the camp director of Camp Tusmahita, and I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. I would like to kind of talk to you about what we've been doing this past year at camp. We have not been operating in person, but we have still been plugging forward, making connections with campers, and we've been able to provide them, I think, a lot of useful programs and a lot of fun for them at home throughout the past year. Um, I'd like to highlight a few of the programs. The pamphlet that we have here in front of you has all the programs that we, part that we uh, allowed our campers to participate in over the past year. But some of my favorite programs were the Family Nature Club program, which we offered throughout the school year. And during the school year, uh, the Family Nature Club, we usually have in person, but we had to kind of rethink things and we were able to put together something um, like a camp in a box type of situation. And each program with the Family Nature Club incorporated something that the campers could cook and work on their independent living skills at home in their own kitchens. They did some sort of STEM activity, which included science, technology, engineering, and math. 
and that was something that they had to create or build or construct with their families at home and it included a craft that they were able to make at home with their family and it also provided them with some sort of fun outdoor adventure activity that they could do. So each of those programs incorporated for the uh, Family Nature Club incorporated that and one of my favorite uh, Family Nature Clubs that we did was this past November of last year um, where the campers made cinnamon and sugar toast. They actually made butter from scratch using marbles and the shaking method. They created a STEM activity where they had to, they were given a challenge to create some sort of chute so that the squirrels at Camp T could find some way to store their acorns for the fall. They learned some strategies for raking leaves and having fun outside in nature with leaves that, um, that year. And they also made their craft, which is a no-sew um, blanket. And that was probably my most favorite craft that we made. One of the families shared their story with me because part of the giving thanks theme was that they would donate their blanket to someone that they were thankful for. So last year, uh, one family wanted to donate it to their great grandmother. And at the time they were not able to visit their great grandmother in the nursing home. So they kind of uh, got creative and they took some pictures of delivering their package to her. And so they slid it through the, the sliding door and they watched her open the card that they made for her. And they watched her open the blanket that they created for her. And the pictures were priceless to me to see it make it full circle. We were hoping that they would do that. They followed through and she was grateful to her family and I was grateful for the family for sharing the pictures with us. So it was a pretty special moment for me and for the family um, receiving that and participating with that activity. One of the other family nature clubs that we did was that was a lot of fun for our staff as well as our families was an around the world adventure and that Around the World Adventure, um, we actually took them on a journey. Each of these programs had a virtual aspect to it. So um, one of the meetings that we had with Around the World Adventure, we traveled with the family. We had, they had passports. They had to mark on their passport where they were traveling to. Um, our staff dressed up in different attire virtually um, and were the tour guides. We had... Uh, a flight attendant that guided them through. We had sound effects for everything. So they were able to experience the world outside of Michigan because traveling was not <coughs> possible at that time. Um, and still had a lot of fun learning about um, different cultures and different languages and had a lot of fun um, learning new things virtually. Um, so that was one of my favorites too. We had a lot of other programs that we offered throughout the summer. Um, the Summer Family Challenge was held in July, and with that program, families were encouraged to spend 100 hours of time outside with their families in nature, doing things outside, and we had a lot of families participate with that. Not all the families met their goal, uh, but they had a lot of fun doing it. We had two families that surpassed their goal. They actually tied for first place for 192 hours of time outside. Um, so that's over six hours a day for their families to be enjoying nature and experiencing things outside. So that was good to see. And I had several families say that they continued to make goals part of the programs. They had to set some goals and um, they were going to continue to set some goals so that they could continue to enjoy their time outside because they had a lot of fun doing that together. One of our other summer programs was the um, Club Connect with our teens that we did. We wanted to be able to reach our teens. We felt there was um, not as many teens participating like as we wanted to, so we wanted to connect teens together from around the state of Michigan. And during that Club Connect, we had different themes from the Olympics to nature to music, and it was a great time just to allow the teens to connect with one another, engage with one another, laugh. We had a lot of fun for everybody that participated in that, uh, in that program. So those are just some of the programs. I'd probably like to talk about all of them. We don't have that time today, but you'll see in the um, 
the annual report that we have some of the other programs that we offer but even though we were experiencing some of these those things virtually and from a distance with some of that programming there was a lot happening at camp as well um, we had a lot of building activities going on and uh, construction taking place and Michelle's going to go over some of those things when we think of um, even though we weren't in person at camp trust me there was a lot happening at camp as far as um, duties of contractors coming in and just upkeep and general maintenance and inspections happening at camp in order to keep keep us moving forward so Michelle's going to go over some of those um, projects I guess you could say okay, thanks Jill so in the booklet that you have in front of you on page 28 you'll see a full list of the facility updates that were completed or are planned for camp um, some of the big things that we did this past year were our new entryway for the gate um, new Oak Recreation Center a brand new building for goalball and other indoor activities um, we had a couple wells at camp that were original from the 70s that were due to be replaced, so we were able to get those going and various other um, updates for the facilities. So I'll go ahead and turn over to the one-page budget that you have, and this is our proposed budget for the upcoming year. Um, starting at the top, salary and benefits, we have two staff members, Jill, our camp director, and a new position, a high adventure camp consultant which will be a seasonal position. Um, we're able to absorb all of those costs this year into another funding stream that we have within LIO so that we can allocate more of the camp funding towards operating costs and facility updates. Um, so some of our general operating costs you'll see listed out here. Dues, food service, we will be continuing our contract with Greenville Public Schools for food service. Licensing inspection and certification fees, mailing services and postage so that has gone up because of a lot of the virtual activities and materials that we send out to kids maintenance supplies and replacement parts uh, personal protective equipment so paying for hand sanitizer uh, masks different things to help keep campers safe prizes and awards to non-employees so this is for um, when we have volunteers that are willing to come out and help with different camp groups or activities we're able to offer them a small payment to cover some of their costs like mileage and um, being able to travel to camps property insurance we work with DTMB to make sure that we have insurance for the camp and that's our annual fee rubbish removal services supplies and materials for programming telecommunications and utilities and fuel and then for our equipment this upcoming year we will be um, continuing to lease our state of Michigan truck that's the 7200 and then we do need a new gator uh, utility vehicle for camp the one we have there is about 20 years old so we're looking to purchase a new gator for camp this year and then down under capital improvements and facility updates it's uh, the 1.65 we currently have a request into the state budget office for uh, 1.3 million dollars and that's to cover the cost for a new nature center we're planning to renovate Elm Hall an existing facility at camp to make it a to a nature center for campers we also plan to construct a new pole barn or maintenance building so all of the maintenance equipment at camp is currently housed in Elm Hall so we need a new structure to transfer all of that equipment to so that we can build the new nature center we also have other various facility updates we're putting in a generator system power seems to go out quite often in the area um, so having a standby power system is really crucial to make sure that our pipes don't freeze and burst and we need new floors and things like that um, we also plan to convert Roth cabin into a museum for various materials um, from the former Michigan School for the Blind um, and then finally travel we've allocated a small amount for various travel if Jill or other camp staff members need to go to trainings or different um, events around the state and then our grand total would be 1,801,100 assuming that we get the 1.3 million increase from the state budget office 
So as all of you can see, we have a lot going on. This is 300 acres. We have one maintenance person. We have Jill and only one camp consultant besides the part-time office person. And they do a lot for this. So we count on our volunteers. We count on the LIO staff. Uh, these two are just great people as far as the work that they do behind the scenes uh, for our kids. And this budget proposal that Michelle's worked hard on doing uh, is a collaborative effort. We work with DTMB, who has been very gracious, as well as our Office of Finance Management in getting figures that we need. It is a trust, so it is a balance. You don't want to spend all of your trust. You want it to keep going on and on for generations. So we're very careful when we ask for these increases. As the camp has aged since 74, there are definitely some improvements needed as generations have changed and the needs have changed. Um, we are trying to make sure that we do a technology camp. Um, when we have meetings from ISD groups, we want to make sure we have the equipment for them to be well facilitated. Uh, so there are a lot of needs that have just come up the past few years that we're trying to get in align with uh, what we need. And I just want to point out one thing that wasn't mentioned in here is did you know licensing inspections and all. Jill does a great job in keeping up with all of these licensing requirements. It's just a quiet thing behind the scenes. But we are underneath county inspections, state inspections, um, company inspections for our equipment, and, and, and they do a great job. But in the end, it's all for the kids. And I've got the best job in the world, because I tell you what, when we do this and the work we do across the street, it's great to see the kids and the families and the teachers all say, thank you. So thank great. you, Dr. Rice and State Board of Ed members. Um, that's our presentation. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, be, uh, be on the lookout for a, uh, another visitor coming up this <laughs> school year. May I please have a motion to approve the spending plan for Camp Tuskegee? A move by Dr. Pugh and seconded by Dr. Pritchett. Any discussion? Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. McMillan. Uh, could uh, either yourself or Scott uh, quickly just explain this is before us because, you know, I mean, we don't do a lot of approvals of specific uh, programs. Could you just remind us why this is before us every year? Uh, as far as I know, it's been before since I've been here, Tom. I guess. Uh, but I mean, do we have some kind of? It's it's our requirement, uh, the board. To, it's our authority. Yes, it is an MDE uh, budget item. It doesn't run through the Office of Special Education because it's a trust item, and Ann Richmond's office usually runs through trust. It has always come to the board for final approval in the way that we spend the funds. Okay. Uh, how much is the camp director and the high adventure camp consultant going to be that's absorbed? With salary and benefits, it'll be a little over a hundred thousand for both combined. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and um, the budget, the operating cost, is that based on in person or not in person? You know, is that so? If, if for some reason you don't go in person, these will change substantially. Um, no, nope, it it remains consistent whether we're virtual or in person. A lot of these costs have to do with just general upkeep of the camp. Um, and the campgrounds of 300 acres. Um, so, yep, I don't anticipate a huge difference okay. on whether we're in person or virtual. Okay. Food service would probably be yeah. the item oh, that yeah. would come off. That's the only item that really would be taken off of the budget. Because when we don't use the 35000 as we did in this past year that was budgeted for, we absorb it into other activities. So we happen to get this uh, generator that we didn't anticipate doing this year, but we didn't have food service. So we needed a statewide, not statewide, but a site-wide generator and decided, you know what, we didn't use this for food service. We really do need a generator to help with all the facilities we've got. Okay. And then the $1.6 million, is that the items on page 28, the plan for 2022? Is that pretty much what it would be covered with that? Correct. Okay. And then is there, a, is there some kind of a governing board or is that us or who? Nikki is the trustee member for the board. Okay. That. Are there other that, trustees? We used to have Michelle Fecto was the other trustee. So you only have one trustee? We do. And we have Ann Richmond. Uh, we have Scott Keneshek, uh, Office of Special Education represented. Let, let's define trustee. When you say trustee, are you well, talking what about I mean, one board okay, member? So who could say uh, any, any child who has to go, that wants to go to camp has to be vaccinated but for COVID? That would be guidance from the Department of Ed because we are under the 
Okay, so there's no board that would there's no board that would make that decision. Doctor, would it be would it be, Doctor Rice would make that decision? It's a program operated within the Department of Ed, so I. We haven't had this discussion, Tom. I don't. Okay. I don't have an answer. All right. Certainly. I mean, I, I is that a possibility that children uh, may be required to be vaccinated to go there? No. It's um, not a possibility. Uh, okay. I, I don't. I don't see it as a possibility, separate and distinct from children across the state being required to be vaccinated. So it could. They could be required. Still does as follow. part of a larger, as part of something larger, yes. As a standalone, I don't see it. It, it, it it's something. I mean, uh, frankly, we've not had this conversation. So, okay, but I'm being asked to approve this. I wouldn't want to approve it if there's going to be a requirement for vaccination. So, um, you'd prefer, can you can, you'd prefer to deny the experiences to children because of the requirement to vaccinate? Well, it, okay. if it's unhealthy, I mean, if it, these are if kids. They don't want it, then there's the discrimination, right? If we're going to discriminate against kids who the parents feel are not, you know, because of immunocompromising or whatever, they don't want to. Uh, yeah, I, I would have a concern about that discrimination. I, I'm I'm not sure that there's been any uh, conversation anywhere about a um, a requirement to have a vaccination mandate for for children no, I at Camp not. Tasmahita. Right, I hope not. I'm just saying if there would be, would you bring that before us? If that was your decision beforehand? I'm, I'm, I'm at a loss as to why it would be our decision. Uh, I'm just trying, well, me, I'm trying to figure out who it is. Well, it seems to me that there would be there would be two controlling authorities in that regard. One would be a, a, a local health department, and the other would be the state state health department. I don't think in either case we're it. And we also have regulations we have to follow for children's camp that Jill does have to stay in touch with, as far as um, we're the state of Michigan. Okay. So if the local health department says there's not a requirement, then there won't be. We, we we have to abide by the, the same authority structures that everybody else uh, does. Um, the you know the state health department and the and the local health department. Um, I'm not aware. Again, I'm not aware that this has been that this has been raised. I'm not saying the, it has. The I'm raising not, it now. The issue is not a mask mandate, as I understand your question. It's a vaccination mandate. Right. And I think it's. Um, I'm just trying to figure out who would make that decision. That's all. And so you're saying it would be the, the state a, health a, department? A vaccination mandate would be handled by public health officials. It wouldn't be. Okay. All right. Thank you. I mean, to Tom's point, um, do we consider whether children who attend the camp have to wear masks? I mean, that that is something that has been put into the hands of locals. So. That, I mean, and that's, is that's, the question that's a of vaccination mandate or a mask mandate? Well, mine was a vaccination. But, okay, that's but what I'm I raising. Uh, but now, I'm, uh, now that he did raise that point, I'm raising that the point. Do who who would be the who would be the body other than the health department? Can you speak to this. So we do have campers that are planning on coming out, and we do ask that if they're inside, that they wear a mask unless there's a medical reason. Oh. We are outdoor. They usually are not indoors together. We have separate sleeping facilities. Our first group is only three. We have limited the number of campers that we are allowing at camp now, and again, it's based on some guidance for children's camps in Michigan. You're predominantly outdoors we to the are. extent possible. You yeah, know, we're usually only indoors to get your food, and even there we have a separate outside facility now, so weather permitting, they will probably be getting their trays and going to Red Pine, which is an outdoor screened-in facility. But, yeah, the whole purpose of camp is to be outside. Okay, or, yeah. Um, and, I mean, it, it was, uh, um, I, I was intrigued by the question because, I, you know, who does make those decisions? If, can I? Uh, Please. Yeah. I mean, and to that point, I mean, I, it is good that children are outside, but the things that came to my mind is mm -hmm. typical places where children are gathering, and that would be around water, which I'm assuming is is um, it's private water yeah. system. Okay, so it's checked. Um, oh, yeah. We have a lot of inspections. Yeah, that mm -hmm. that other municipal waters water would not have. And then, um, you know, as you are doing your renovations, 
as uh, we're doing those, we're looking at ventilation and all of that. Oh. But again, you know, good that the children are get to spend time outside. Yes, and things have changed, and so we are definitely trying to be hands-free for a lot of our pieces that weren't before inside restrooms, um, making sure that the number of students, you know, that you don't have a crowd in the mm -hmm. stalls. So Jill's done an excellent job in posting different signs and reminding. So like I said, we haven't even had a group out yet. So we are planning something this fall. Um, in fact, this weekend we've got three families, as mentioned, mm -hmm. um, and we have got two of our LIO consultants working with Jill to make sure that things are enforced. Okay. I mean, I'm just thinking because with um, Eagle, they have that program for the ventilation for all schools, for where children are, you know, if, if there is that need and if we are putting funding into the building, we want to make sure that we're uh, doing things uh, that are going to be more healthy for the children. So, And that Eagle program is going to be increasingly impactful over a period of years fueled by additional resources to to make it yeah it's necessary yeah yeah, yeah. Um, board members any other discussion hearing none uh, Marilyn if you take a roll call vote please Lipton yes McMillan um, I think I'm gonna pass Pritchett yes Hughes? Yeah. Meyers absent Strayhorn yes Tilly Absent, Albridge? Yes. Five yes. Thank you. Motion passes. The next item on today's agenda is state and federal legislative update. Mr. Martin Ackley, Director of the Office of Public and Governmental Affairs, will lead the state and federal legislative update. Followed by... Uh, Brief discussion by Chairwoman uh, Ellen Lipton. And finally, Dr. Judy Pritchett on uh, report on NASB's request for boards to take action on public education positions, amendments to bylaws, and a voting delegate. Mr. Ackley, welcome. Thank you very much. A um, couple of things that I'll briefly discuss in the, about the, the legislature, and then um, Ms. Lipton can discuss the uh, State Board's Legislative Committee meeting. The uh, state budget is being finalized now. I, um, it's being reported that it's being finalized today and the votes will be taken next week in the legislature to adopt the budget. Um, so that's positive news. And then the um, Senate Education Committee yesterday posted a meeting for today at noon where they reported out four bills, um, Senate Bills 600, 601, 602, and 603. And they all address um, vaccinations and masking. Um, Senate Bill 600 will prohibit school districts from adopting or implementing a policy that requires enrolled students to receive an emergency use vaccination to attend school, ride a bus, or participate in school-sponsored activities. Uh, Senate Bill 601 would require districts to have a waiver process in place if they have a policy that requires students to wear a mask. Um, Senate Bill 602 would prohibit the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services from promulgating or enforcing a rule that requires a, a child to receive an emergency use vaccination, wear a mask, or be tested for COVID-19 if the child is asymptomatic. And Senate Bill 603 would prohibit the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services from issuing an emergency order that requires students to wear a face mask, receive an emergency use vaccination, or be tested for COVID-19 if the child is asymptomatic. There's more to the bills, but those are basically what the bills do. They were reported out of committee today um, on a partisan basis, four to one vote. So they go to the Senate floor uh, for consideration. So those are the, the House um, and Senate have, are both meeting. Uh, they're in session now after a summer break. And um, the House Education Committee has not posted a meeting yet, as of yet. But the Senate did act, the Senate Committee did act today on those four bills, moved them out. And uh, that's my report from the legislature. Oh, I'm sorry, just to clarify, the a Senate Committee voted them out. Correct. They have not gone to the full Senate yet. Correct. They're on their way now to the full Senate to the Senate floor for consideration. Okay. Right. And the House was it committee or was it the full House? The House has not done. The They've House not done anything. Okay. All right. The House committee has not met. Full the the full House has met, um, but really hasn't taken up much action yet. But they expect next week to be voting on the budget bills. Okay. 
Other uh, other questions on the presentation. So the expectation relative to time frame. One more time. The legislature will take up the budget. It's being finalized today, from what I understand, and the votes will be taken next week. There's a question about whether how the votes will be taken next week because the Mackinac Center Public Policy Conference is also scheduled for next week. So the um, the intent is for the legislature to vote two days next week to adopt the budget by the end of September, which is of course the deadline. So. Okay, all right, thank you. And time frame associated with the four bills. There's no time frame on that. It's just however the, the Senate wants to move and then it has to be considered in the House. Okay, very good. And the latter is late breaking news. Yes, I mean, the, the meeting was scheduled yesterday and it was at noon today, noon to one o'clock, they took testimony and they reported the bills out, yes. Okay, all right, good to know. Thank you very much. Yep. Um, any other questions for Mr. Ackley? Uh, Dr. Pritchett, Dr. Pugh. Thank you. Going back to our discussion this morning when we were getting the assessment report uh, and talking about the waivers, at this point, um, has there been any discussion with the legislature or does, do we think there will be discussion coming from the legislature? I know MDE has discussed it about um, waiving the requirement for the um, ADAP based on the MSEP scores that we reviewed this morning. Well, as you may, as, as you undoubtedly recall, Dr. Pritchett, um, we have persistently raised this with the legislature and the board uh, doubled down on that through the legislative committee initially and then through a resolution of the full board uh, back in the, the spring. The legislature has yet, yet to act. Is there any suggestion that it will? No. In fact, Dr. Rice sent a letter to the legislative leaders um, requesting uh, to move the deadline back on the A through F at least. And we have not heard anything back from the legislature on that. Okay, I just wanted to verify that. Yeah. All right, right. so you. at this point, the expectation is that A through F will be released this fall. Right. It's unfortunate. It is unfortunate, particularly Three given the, the, I mean, irrespective of whether you believe that the A through F accountability system is a good one, clearly premised on incomplete, incomplete state summative yeah. results, yep. it is not a good idea to uh, run it this year. It's different from, it's a different argument than whether you buy it enduringly, whether you buy it over a period right. of years, whether you buy it in a pandemic when you're testing 71% in ELA and math and uh, a smaller percentage in science and social studies is a different story. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. If, if no other, I'm sorry, Dr. Dr. Pugh, I yeah. beg your pardon. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, and, and this may be for um, Ms. Um, Redinger as well as, as uh, you. Do where, How do we see the fate of these going? Do, do we um, envision the governor vetoing uh, these bills? What, how do you think that they will move? You know what? You know what? We, we are not going to have Marty weigh in on fate. But if Patty Redinger wants to weigh in on faith, she certainly may weigh in on faith. But that, that, is, that, is, above, that is above Marty's pay grade to weigh in on, on faith. Uh, Ms. Redinger, um, we're, we're no, no to crystal have you in ball the room. here. Um, uh, no crystal ball here. And, you know, as, again, with the end of the legislative session, um, uh, we'll have a mountain of bills to consider. So I have, I have no insight to provide on that front. Uh, okay. All right. Thank you. Did you hear that? I, I, I think she said she would be um, depending on fate as well. So she, she doesn't know. <laughs> okay. All right. Fair, fair, fair enough. That's okay. what I think that I heard. All right. All right. Good enough. Um, if there are no other questions for Mr. Ackley, if we could pivot to uh, Chairwoman Lipton, that would be great. Thank you, Dr. Rice. Um, the Legislative Committee met on August the 26th. Uh, so we did not have the this late breaking news um, to discuss or or consider in our legislative committee. In fact, 
when we by meeting in August, um, the legislators were on summer break, um, as they typically are uh, for the months of um, July and August. So our uh, discussion focused on what we could do or what we have done with respect to getting some legislative clarity on A through F. Um, we had talked about possibly discussing another resolution to present to the full board, uh, but we ultimately decided that another resolution, another letter, um, another effort that we had done what uh, was in our power to do. We had already taken those steps. Um, and so we opted to not um, bring anything uh, from the legislative committee um, other than uh, just a, a discussion on what, what possible tools are at our disposal. Um, it did occur to me as we were we were thinking as we were um, discussing this topic, um, and given the statement um, and the discussion, the very robust discussion that we had about assessments and um, the uh, definitional um, confusion that sometimes arises around assessments and what have you, um, we may want to think about as the time that the A through F might be um, hitting the presses, so to speak, um, at the very least, providing some additional context or guidance uh, to people, perhaps the press, perhaps parents, that might um, uh, inappropriately review um, what that... Uh, what that data might mean. Um, and I'm sure that's something that the department is already contemplating. Um, but we, uh, we did not take any formal steps um, at the legislative committee, as I said, other than what we had already presented in the past um, and that this full body adopted. Okay, thank you very much, um, Chairwoman. Uh, Vice President Pugh. So my, my questions, um, I, I had posted some questions um, and sent them to Dr. Rice and Dr. Albright and said that we would I would discuss them here. And I think that they overlap here. Typically, when we do a resolution, we're speaking to the, we're, often we're speaking to bills that are being proposed by the legislature. But are we ever talking to the governor? We are. Mm -hmm. We then will those are sent to we the are, governor. We, we are we are in constant communication with the governor's office. That's not. I'm sorry. That wasn't my question. I, I didn't. Call, I didn't ask the question right. When we're writing our resolutions, I'm, I can't think. I'm thinking that we're typically writing them in the audiences to the um, our resolutions as a board. The audience is more so for the legislature, and I can't think if we're if the audience is broader and in this uh, and at this time it would be for the governor. So we, we as a rule do not write the resolutions um, to, to the governor. Um, we're in communication with the governor's office daily. We do a lot of work with the governor's office on many, many, many pieces of legislation. If we have particular issues that we want to share with the governor's <clears throat> office, we share them with the governor's office, but uh, we, we don't, as a rule, tailor resolutions for the governor. They're typically for the legislature. They, they, are, they are for the legislature, for Congress, or, or, or for another legislative body, as a rule. And why would it? Well, I was okay. going to say, I do recall one time that we did write something that was specific to the governor's office, and okay. I remember the department sent it on our behalf over there. Okay. I guess my, my question is whoever, wherever you're going to make your impact. That's, and, yeah, I don't think and, that there's any rule to it. I'm just saying that I think as that typically what we've done is we've, we've written these to influence legislatures, either Congress or the state legislature. There's nothing that precludes us writing from any to, to anybody. Right. 
Yeah, yeah cuz I would think we would want to influence legislation and we would. so that's that that that's where I was going and and really before I was going to lay out some questions that I had and obviously given the developments um I wanted to make sure that we were moving in a way and also addressing the appropriate bodies um, because I think that we've seen enough from the legislature. Um, of course, uh, I still would like to see the governor respond to the mask mandate um, as a statewide issue through the Department of Health and Human Services. But I think, you know, given President Biden's uh, recent um, call around vaccines and that has been for for uh, employees so um, that has been for employees not not um, which which would be teachers it's not been children um, no one has talked about children and vaccines that I that I can recall at the table um, but I and so that's I wanted to know that was my question how can we proceed with the uh, State Board of Education drafting our, our related resolutions that are related now um, to me they're imminent because we have children that we want to protect but they're imminent now because there's legislation that's moving forward and um, there is some um, authority that the governor has that, that I, I would like to be able to to focus on um, if we're willing to consider resolutions and I guess um, chairwoman Lipton how how can we proceed in that. The other thing that I put in, in my email is that we've continued to, to um, increase in COVID cases, COVID positivity rates, hospitalization rates, death rates um, since we last met. Um, and so I know that there will be some um, information that will be coming out in the next two weeks as it relates to what the federal government can, what that executive directive and those rules will look like. And then once those are made, the Michigan um, legislature can't um, can't hamper with those from what I understand. But what can we do um, on our end that can also um, protect the children? And how can we do that quickly? And who should we be addressing it to? Can, can we address, address it to the the focus be more towards the governor. Okay, so that is a, um, uh, Ms. Lipton, would you care to respond to that? Just my, my own, um, my own thoughts. The next legislative committee is scheduled to be on September 30th. And it's certainly something that we can um, take up at the next um, legislative committee meeting, as I said, on September 30th. Um, I don't know if that would meet um, the particular time frame. It really, I mean, I suspect that the bills won't move um, out of the House before our next board meeting, but it's, it's quite possible that after they pass the budget um, at the end of this month that they will fast track them. I mean, I just, um, it'd probably be worth a call into the bill sponsors to find out what their, um, what their calendar is. You know, when the legislature wants to fast track bills, they can, they certainly can. So we may not have time to take something up at the next month's board meeting is what I'm saying. And there's nothing else that we can do between that time. I know I ask this question all the time, but so that's, that's our process now. I mean, I know we used to be able to do it a little bit different until we got the opinion of the AG's office. And I can't remember if that was just the easier way to do things or if that's the only way to do things. The other thing you can do is call a special meeting. Okay. And I think the legislature, I'm sorry, I think the legislative committee meetings are also, they're, they're noticed under the Open Meetings Act. Um, so you could conceivably, I, I'm not sure, but I, if you properly notice them and everyone attends, um, then I, I guess you could take steps there. 
So I think there's the issue of uh, positions on uh, bills as yet unseen by the board um, and whose timetable is uncertain in the legislature. And then there's the question, uh, by contrast, of what the president has put forward in the last five days and the support or, or not of, of that. So I think that there's a lot to sift through here. And I don't think it's going to, I don't think any of this is going to happen quickly. I think this is going to be over a period of, uh, of months. I think we have time to get it done through the legislative committee and then back to the full board for anything that the full board would like to consider. September 30th is 16 days away. The next board meeting is four weeks away. Um, not a lot is going to uh, transpire to um, change the trajectory of these uh, mm -hmm. policy positions. In the next governor board. could cut a deal that she'll go approve these four if uh, if the budget gets signed in or something. You never know. Okay, um, it's a possibility. Um, in, in any case, Mr. Chairman, this is yeah. Nikki. Can I speak? Please. Um, assuming that we can move on, is that what we're going to do next? No, what, I, I mean, let, let's finish the discussion on this particular item if we could, okay. Ms. Snyder. Yeah. Okay. So I, I'd like us. I'd like to come to to some resolution on this. If you'd like, if you'd like the legislative committee to reflect upon. I'd just like to be clear, are we reflecting upon the four bills that were, um, that were the subject of discussion today? Are we reflecting upon the president's um, release on, what I, yeah. What I sent to you yesterday was an urgent issue because I, was, cause I know that we have case rates rising, so on and so forth. So these were already urgent issues, but now that, um, We've received this report. Uh, to me, it's it's uh, the same issue, but it's just more urgent because we have bills that are before us. Right. So, Patty, uh, Ms. Redinger, can you share your thoughts on these four bills and their trajectory? Is there any understanding about that? Um, I'll tell you. I'm uh, unfortunately, Dr. Rice. I don't have any eye line into them. Um, you know, I, I've, I've manage the federal affairs side of the, the house um, from the executive office rather than my colleague George Cook who's our director of legislative affairs to this legislature um, so I, I don't have um, any eyeline into that so apologies there okay thank you I, I can say that I, I would be open to considering um, a special meeting because I think it's that important special meeting for the purpose of considering um, um, how we pull together language around resolutions. Um, yeah, I would say, when did you say the budget is? It, they expect that to vote next week. Mm -hmm. It has to be done by the 30th of, of September. Oh yeah, that's right. Just to clarify, you're talking about a resolution related to Senate Bill 600 through 603, um, which is a totally separate issue than President Biden's. Yes, yeah, so I, well, I think that they're all the, well, the, the issue to me is making sure that we have protections in place right. for our children, that we're putting those in place that have been revoked um, and then we, we're seeing our levels rise. And then we have legislation, and then we have an executive order, and then we have rules that, that are being addressed uh, from, from the federal government as well. So I think that it just, you know, it's all coming together. But has been noted earlier, those rules deal with employer-employee right, relationship. Right, right, right. Absolutely. Um, no discussion that I've read anyways of, you know, K-12, pre-K-12 students. No, so but it may may I don't know how it's going to I don't know how it's going to impact contractors. I don't know how it's going to impact people receiving federal funding. I don't know how it's going to impact 
uh, employees. Um, what does that mean? A hundred businesses or a hundred employees or more for businesses? Right. I don't know what that's no, going to mean for. So I'm not discounting the yeah. impact. I'm just saying. Yeah. In, in right. my mind, we're, we've got two different. Mm -hmm. things going yeah. on here so yeah. and, and, I, I, and i believe I could, these bills may could, be more intimate there, there is no clarity yeah. about this uh, that there are there are meetings taking place across the country now to flesh this out we're going to be in a meeting tomorrow council of two state school officers uh, in a meeting with the white house on this issue tomorrow there are other meetings that are taking place the michigan association of Superintendents and administrators, MASA has has weighed in and has said we think that this would um, entail schools. We don't know yet, um, and so so you've got a you've got a, a lot of um, you know there's a there's there's an absence of clarity around this, and it is going to take quite some time to flesh out. Mm -hmm. It is going to take quite some time to flesh out. Yeah. And I don't feel like I'm talking out of school, but it's been widely reported that this is going to uh, end up in courts of law. Um, it, it is going to literally take place over a period of months, not days, not weeks. Um, and I, I'm referring specifically to, to what the president rolled out last yeah. Thursday. Um, I can't speak to the, the four bills, they were literally posted last, uh, yesterday, they were um, met on today. Um, but, but, the, but the governor has been pretty strong about uh, layered mitigation strategies, and it's unclear that she's going to walk away from the value of those layered mitigation um, strategies. I don't know how politics plays out, but I, I do know as a public health professional, someone who's spent a lot of time in school, um, worked uh, H1N crisis, other crises, um, I do know what we can say that we want to see. And I think that we can, I, w I would like to pull that together. Ideally, I would have liked to ask you some questions, get your thoughts. When are you going to hear a little bit more about some of the things that are going on? But it seems again like uh, that a, that a voice needs to be our voice. I, I would like for our voice to be um, put out there on what I feel is the most critical issue of of the light of my lifetime thus far. And I've seen a lot of things that are public health crises. Um, you know, we can talk about uh, test scores, assessments, but if, if our children can't show up. Um, all of our schools will be graded, you know, I mean, and A to F, I mean, sometimes I do have to say that, and I'm, I'm sorry for saying this because it's probably negative, but sometimes I do feel that it's, that it's on purpose. This is, this is, you know, the things that are being done to our children and then the expectations that people have of our children. Um, I want to make sure that our voice is getting out there because I think that it is a uh, urgent matter. And for me, being on this board and being a public health person, I can't think of a more important thing to to, to speak to. Well, if you'd like to, if you'd like to discuss afterwards at some point, perhaps you and and uh, President Albrecht and I have some conversation. And if there's something that we can flesh out concretely um, that would would benefit from a special meeting, we'll we'll do it. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, anything else on this topic, President Albrecht, nope. and then we're going to, no, that's a no? That's a no. I, okay. I do have one other question that was in the note to, yeah. to, to you, and you Please. and I have talked about it some, um, and I've not really gotten clarity, and that is around if there is widespread um, COVID in a classroom or, or in a school, in a um, district, does that school district have the ability to go to remote learning? And those are questions that I've received and I'm trying to get clarity on that. Yeah, we've had some conversation yes. about and this. Yep. In fact, when, when I was on the island at a conference, yes. when I spoke about this. Uh, Mr. Garant, if you'd like to speak to this. Sure, um, so to your question, I know um, the one that I pressed, we spoke on the island, mm -hmm. we gave you some preliminary information since we've 
of uh, set up communication with two districts to address what are the options currently available for them on the law to do virtual learning in those, if that were to happen. Um, there's Section 21F of the School Aid Act that existed before uh, the pandemic that has been available to districts that would allow them to um, provide virtual learning um, absent of seeking any uh, waivers or approval from, from the Department of Education to do so. Okay. Um, so, I mean, I think what the, what we, I mean, maybe you go hearing this too, I mean, some of the questions we've gotten from districts has been around um, days and hours of attendance where there were flexibilities that were um, provided by the legislature last school year around um, the days and hours. So 180 uh, days scheduled and 1098 hours that aren't there this year. Um, and so, but the, so I think that's maybe some confusion or some question around that difference between last year and this year, but the ability for districts to provide uh, virtual instruction, there, there are options for them to do that, whether it's classroom based, building based, or, you know, if that was a larger district, but, yeah. Um, Yes, and Dr. Rice, I do want to thank you because you did give a lengthy explanation. It was just when I saw something in writing, it seemed a little bit different. And then I got some more questions after that. And then Kyle and I talked, but we didn't get a chance to go into detail. But school districts, if something happens uh, COVID related that they feel that they need to go to remote learning, they will be funded for those pupils. I think that's, I think those are, there are several questions in that. That's not a single question. There are multiple questions. Can you do virtual learning? Yes. Can you get funded for it? Yes. Can you pivot to virtual learning? You can. Can you pivot completely to virtual learning? That's a different story. And uh, there's, some, there's some nuance in that. And I think we shared that in the memos. Perhaps there's more to be shared. Do you have more on this to share? I would just say from a funding perspective, um, uh, when you look at the, the count window is a traditional count um, day, um, which again would be different than, than what was provided for districts last year. But um, and again, I think the majority of the questions we've received around funding has been around the attendance um, issue and, and meeting the 75% uh, uh, attendance threshold on any given day. And so we provided guidance to districts around what that looks like and what their options are should they not be able to meet that because of COVID or So, so to get a full day of foundation allowance for a given school day, have to have at least 75% of your kids in attendance. Okay. There are exceptions to that, but that's the rule. Okay, so let me ask it a little bit different because I want to be clear because, you know, I've shared with we you and, too. And, yeah. and you know I've gotten questions and I didn't see the memo. So my question is, if children are, because we've got, not gotten into the fall and winter months. Um, and typically what we've seen the patterns is that when you get into the fall or winter months, plus we've removed all the protections uh, for many of our children, um, that the COVID rates will go up even more. So if that happens and we're seeing the widespread, which we're seeing outbreaks in schools, um, and we see that, is a school district able to say, I'm going to go remote like we were last year, take the children remote and get funded for that? So under 21F? Yes, correct. Okay. Yes, that is an option. Okay. So they can take this full, all the children remote, get funded. And part of the guidance we put in the memo was to, you know, kind of prompt districts with questions about what they can be doing now to prepare in case they need to flip that switch. Um, yeah, the argument is to, to, to get the paperwork done in advance, be approved under in advance of, don't wait until after the fact. We put out two memoranda on this and they, they've been shared with every school district in the state. They've been shared with every education alliance member in the state and they have been shared with the Board of Education in our weekly board briefs. We'd be happy to share those again, but... Um, uh, no, you don't have to yeah. share it again. I'll look it up. You, you just re you shared it. They, they were shared in the last two weeks, if I recall correctly. The, the week and a half ago. September, well, September 2nd, so it would have been in 
12 days ago. Yeah. Okay. okay. I mean, I, I don't, I mean, I, Kyle and I have spoken, we, you know, I was just waiting to see it because there were questions asked of me. I want to make sure that I'm referring people to you, but I also want to know um, the, what, what the answer is. Yep. And I have reached out to this, uh, Christina, the Flagler Office. Okay. A couple of other conferences. She, I just haven't connected with her yet to just okay. try to understand what her. Okay. Because when it comes to our pricing issues, I mean, there are complexities on there. So if there are specific examples that she's, you know, in terms of a school or a scenario, we want to help, you know, kind of talk through, talk through that with her and give her the best information we can. Right. Because I'll just want to let it be known that I've gotten responses from health department and school district and parent. That, that they're being told from the department that they could not do that. So I'm, that's why I, I just uh, want to make we'd sure. We'd like to, we'd like to know uh, at that point who specifically is saying what, um, so that we can we can pin that when we can pin that down. But we can show you the memoranda that we've put out okay. on uh, on the issue. There was a question while while we're you know, sort of broadly on the topic of uh, of health and outbreaks there there were two questions on outbreaks earlier i would like to respond to those with appreciation to how for the for the quick research on this um mdhhs defines an outbreak as two or more cases so mr mcmillan that's to your question dr pew to your question there have been 70 seven zero 70 new school-related COVID outbreaks in the last seven days in Michigan. To the unasked question, 344 students and staff were infected in these outbreaks. Um, and and, and j just to note that there's an effort to discern where people get infected. Is it, is it imperfect? It, it is. Is it as, as best as we can do at the moment? It is. So, 70 outbreaks with two or more cases defining an outbreak, 344 students and staff involved in those 70 outbreaks. Those are K through 12 or is that? The they, they are, they are pre-K through pre 12. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And 50 of the 70, five zero of the seven zero, 50 of the 70 took place in counties that do not have a local health department mask order in place. One could argue correlation, one could argue causality, but those are the numbers. Questions on that? Okay, very good. If we can pivot to the... I thought Nikki had a question. I beg your pardon, Ms. Snyder. Yes, yeah, sorry, I don't actually have a question. I just wanted to also share that at the legislative committee meeting, we talked about CRT. I don't know who had included it on the agenda or what, oh, yeah. or I, I can't really quite remember what, what brought it up, but oh. I do remember feeling a sense that, you know, all of the rest of the legislative committee members and, and Dr. Rice, you, yes, you can, sorry. Um, that there was a sense that it's not real, it's it's not happening, there isn't a negative impact, it's just a media thing. And I'm hoping that with more uh, communication from parents and students like we saw today and a little bit last month as well, that we will be able to open the dialogue to continue to talk about that. I think it's an issue um, and maybe, maybe we'll have an opportunity to return to it and, and and consider a formal guidance on that as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, sure. Please, and, th no. and then we're going to NASBY. Go ahead. No, go ahead and finish up when we do NASBY. I'm sorry, I just have questions. CRT, um, Nikki reminded me, I asked that question at the last meeting. Where, where do we think that those two bills will be, the House bill and the Senate bill? Have we, did we hear anything from those? No, neither of those bills have been taken up in their respective committees. So okay. I'm okay. not sure what the plan is for that legislatively. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Pritchett Nasby. All right. Thank you. As I indicated at last month's meeting, um, I uh, told, uh, and I did, I sent to all board members um, a lot of uh, information about the NASB conference coming up, and in particular, 
uh, three things that we need to do. One is um, the voting delegate. And as an FYI, I have already signed up for the NASB virtual conference and am available between 4 and 5.30 because that's when they're having their business meeting on Friday, October 8th, um, to be the voting delegate if that's the board's pleasure. But the voting delegate has to vote on two issues. One, approval of NASB's public education positions, which I sent you, I think, on August 16th. And Marilyn resent them with the board packet and amendments to NASB's bylaws. The amendments to NASB's bylaws, quite frankly, in my opinion, as I look through them, are pretty much semantics. They changed NASB Association, they dropped the association and did some other semantics. The public education positions are there um, for state boards of education to access if they are looking for sentence starters, if they are looking for some sort of guidance, for example, if they wanted to do some position papers on digital literacy. Um, so there were four subcommittees. I served on one, Cassandra served on another. Um, I served on accelerated learning, Cassandra served on digital learning, there was social and emotional learning, and there was um, equity. The equity was already included in the public um, education positions. They made a couple of minor changes and a couple of additions. Accelerated learning was not included, so that is a whole new section. Um, hopefully, you've had a chance to look at them, or you looked at them and went, yeah, OK. Mm -hmm. um, so we do need to. Uh, have some sort of direction at this point, though, because NASB is prior to our next regular board meeting. So I don't know whether you want me to put a motion on the floor. I would like that. OK, would you? All right. <laughs> uh, so I would approve um, or make a motion to approve NASB public education positions, amendments to NASB bylaws, uh, and um, again, unless somebody's dying to, um, <laughs> appoint m me as the NASB voting delegate. That doesn't mean you can't register and quote unquote virtually attend their conference. It just means for the business meeting, we can only have one vote. So we have a motion. Do we have a second? Support. Is there any discussion? Um, yeah, I was looking at. Um, Looking at this public education positions, I, what, what way, I mean, why are we approving public education positions? Um, I mean, it, these aren't, okay, these are not uh, employment positions, just diff different positions, including, I look at the one on page 11, racial equity, and it's got kind of that buzz phrase of, of CRT. I mean, it sounds but removing and identifying and removing structures that perpetuate racism. I'd like to know what that means. Obviously, I oppose racism, but that's kind of a, a buzz phrase. If you Google that, you'll see CRT everywhere. It's the part of the CRT theory. Um, I'd love to know what structures, uh, can I get some examples of structures that per perpetuate racism? Uh, but if not, you know, I just, I'll uh, pass on this one. Certainly support Judy. Okay, well, well uh, Judy, that's, um, th that's both good and bad. Um, would, you, would you care to respond to uh, uh, Mr. McMillan's um, the, rhetorical question? Tom, my understanding of the public education positions is it's a reference guide for, again, state boards of education to reference to say what, would, what has NASB um, written about this particular position that we might use or we might not use. So for example, if we wanted to write some sort of uh, position on accelerated learning, I'm using that one because that was the committee I was on, so I know it the best, then we might look to this position paper document and say, all right, this is what NASB has put down. We might take it, might add to it, might delete some parts of it. So that's what that part of their um, document is there for. Uh, they made some changes this year, so by their bylaws, it has to come uh, to their business meeting. I don't think it has been voted on 
in at least the last two or three years is the understanding I'm getting. Cassandra, is that what, at their first meeting was kind of. Yeah, and we didn't look at the whole document. No. They looked at just little pieces of it. And there's certainly things in there that I would disagree with as well, but the reality is we don't own this. We're no. simply just, you know, we're one of 50. 50 well, less, I don't think all Slightly 50. less than 50 voices. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, but I mean, yeah, but for some reason I'm being asked to support this as a position, and I just, unless I understand what it means um, specifically, because I know it's a low, it can be used in various ways, um, including tearing down capitalism uh, is a structure that is uh, that many uh, on the left, hard left, believe perpetuate racism. So I certainly um, would have a problem uh, saying that I would be able to approve this. Okay, fair enough. Okay. Any other discussion on the motion that is on the table? Hearing none, if we could have a roll call vote, please. Lipton? Yes. McMillan? No. Perchett? Yes. Hugh? Yes. Snyder? Absent, but listening on the phone. Strayhorn? Yes. Tilly? She is absent, not on the phone. Albrich? Yes. Five yes. Okay, motion passes. Comments by state board members. Are there board members who wish to offer comments? Sure. Mr. McMillan. Uh, you know, in the last month, um, uh, there's been a couple counties that have sent out letters to parents whose children were identified as through contact tracing that had been um, near somebody who had COVID. And the letters uh, say that uh, if you don't quarantine your child for something that the CDC says is not is less harmful than the flu, then we will go to court and remove your child from you. Um, so I know of St. Clair County, and there's at least one other county, one on the west side, that has been putting these out. At least one of them said we, did, we weren't serious. We wouldn't actually do it. But uh, I think that's pretty alarming. Um, also, an incident happened this morning, and I just wanted to get clarification because it was somehow seemed that the chair, if as long as somebody says uh, the person to my left uh, and then attacks them personally, that's okay as long as they don't actually say their name. Um, I would hope that that's we're not going to play those kind of games. That basically, you know, that that would be uh, called out of order, and and you know. We wouldn't allow that. So I, I, I hope that, that that's going to be the case. I appreciate that. Um, happy to take that under advisement. Thank you. Um, other other reflections from state board members? President Albridge? There's an article in today's Washington Post about um, National Heritage Academies, and um, they're uh, trying to sell a number of their school buildings. Um, and this is Michigan is prominently featured in this article. Um, there's some concerning things in here uh, related to potentially unrelated or uh, non-arm's length um, activities. Uh, I, I would just ask that the department take a look at this um, and uh, if there are anything that seems extremely concerning, which I think there are, um, we, we have a conversation about that and address it. Okay. Have you sent that to me? Yes. Okay. All right. Very good. Thank you. Um, other board member comments? Going once, twice, thrice. Future meet. Uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Pugh. I, I, I guess I'll, I'll bring up that I did. Um, I, I have been disappointed. I've said it about three or four times today that there is not a statewide mandate um, using the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Um, uh, uh, emergency uh, um, epidemic orders that can be used. Uh, I did uh, write a letter to the governor and to uh, others, uh, Ms. Redinger, and you and Cassandra were copied on that letter. And I do hope that we continue to look for ways to protect our children. I, you know, as we look at the Biden plan uh, or the Biden, um, what comes out of that if there's any ways that we can make sure that our children are protected, whether it's having uh, the staff uh, be vaccinated, whether it's um, masking children, uh, making sure that our children are tested and that we're uh, doing contact tracing as soon as possible. 
um, I'm hoping that we're looking at those items. I did ask the question um, of the governor and Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, um, what, be, what would be indicators? What would it take? What would be the parameters for um, there to be a mass mandate that was revoked, that was removed? Um, what would it take to reinstate those? And I, and I do say that um, we are three times um, the hospitalization rates that we were last year this time, and we haven't even gotten into the fall and winter months. I'm sorry, three times the, um, the positivity rate. We went from three this time last year to around nine um, this year. Hospitalizations, 1,500 this now, around 500 this time last year, and we had uh, the mask mandates. Uh, it's going to take time for vaccines to take a hold, even if when we do, I'm going to seek um, in hope and in prayer that we do get more people vaccinated. Um, but I am yet disappointed that we do not have a mask mandate. I am thankful that this morning I did receive a response from the Department of Health and Human Services. I haven't really even had a chance to look at the, the letter fully, uh, but I don't know if it answers the question of what would be the parameters that would uh, get a mask mandate back here um, in, in the state of Michigan, something that the Biden administration is asking based on all the science, all the data that we're seeing that we're in far um, worse shape now than we were last year. And now we have all the children in the schools. We have the fall and winter before us. So I'll, I'll look at the letter. I am appreciative that there was a response, but um, I, I just hope that our children can be protected and their families. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pugh. Other, um, other reflections from board members? Okay, hearing none. Future board meetings are October 12th, November 9th, and December 14th, all Tuesdays, all at 9.30. If there are any topics board members would like included in future meeting agendas, please notify Marilyn or me. The time is 4.16. We give you back board the gift of time. Thank you. <laughs>